You want to return women to chattel. You want women to be like your wife, passed around town. I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm not going to take moral lectures on the rights of women from somebody who treats their, supposedly, their wife in what ought to be a holy sacrament as a communal sex toy. So forgive me if I decline to take any lectures from you on women's bloody rights. As for gay rights, no thanks. <laughs>Everybody. My name is James Cowell. I am the president and the COO of Uncensored America at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Wanted to thank you guys uh, so very much for coming out tonight. It means a great deal to me and to everybody who put this event together. I also wanted to say if any of you want to get involved with us, you can find anybody with a volunteer tag or myself or Sean, uh, and we'll get you set up with everything else you may need. And with that out of the way, I will hand this over to Sean, and I hope you guys have a great night. So. Good evening, everybody. Sorry to keep you waiting. Complicated business. But thank you, James, for that intro, and thank you, everybody, for attending. This is a massive event, but one of the biggest ever at the University of Tennessee. So thank you guys for coming out for this. Um, and I think we see a lot of familiar faces here, people who've come to our previous events. We're going to keep doing them every semester, and we're expanding all across the country. We're at four campuses now, Penn State, University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, University of South Carolina, and of course right here at Knoxville at University of Tennessee. So, if you would like to start a chapter in your campus, I know a bunch of people are interested in that, you can go online right now to uncensoredamerica.us, and there's a link right there, there's right below when you scroll down past the Milo Destiny graphics, there's a link where you can start your own chapter, and there's also our Discord, which is a lot of fun, met a lot of new friends in there, and our email list, and our Twitter, I, well, we were banned on Facebook for a bit, but we have it back now, so you can follow us there too, and follow us on all kinds of other social media platforms. So, if you'd like to do that, like I said, uncensoredamerica.us is where everything's at. Um, but if you're not too familiar with us, we're simply a free speech organization. We just want to bring back a free speech culture to America where you can say what you want and have the debates you want about the topics you want. Because it seems like nowadays, uh, not just with you know, the cancel culture of celebrities, but even in your private life, even with your friends, your coworkers, you can't really say what you think. You can't really talk about the issues you want to talk about, express your opinion. A lot of people are scared to express themselves. So that's what we're trying to fight back against is big tech censorship, cancel culture, and just being able to have conversations again. So glad you're all coming out to engage with us, and we're going to have a great time as we have this very controversial subject, Christian nationalism, which... Not a lot of people know what Christian nationalism is, um, but it's a growing new political ideology that kind of combines nationalism with Christianity, it's kind of in the name, makes sense. But the idea is that we have a more religious uh, center core to our government. So we're gonna be debating that tonight, and we have somebody who's gonna be in the pro, somebody who's gonna be in the negative, and we will go over the debate rules once we announce our debaters. So without further ado, in the negative, we have someone who's very, very famous for debating pretty much anyone from the left, right, middle, center, everywhere. He started his career as a StarCraft II streamer and on Twitch, which he's now banned from because, again, talk about something you're not allowed to talk about on Twitch. And now he's live streams gaming, talks about politics and canvassing all across the country. And recently, like I said, Twitch permanently banned him, and he's now on alternative platforms like Rumble, Kick. You probably know him better as Destiny. And now, in the affirmative, we will have a New York Times bestselling author and a, this is his bio, award-winning investigative reporter, a reformed sodomite, a global political sensation, a free speech martyr, an accomplished serial entrepreneur, a hair icon, a penitent, and to the annoyance of his many enemies, a happy person. You all know him, though, as Milo Yiannopoulos.
<laughs> All right, so the rules for this debate, we're going to go over real quickly before we start, but the question we're going to be answering today is should Christian nationalism be the dominant governing ideology of America? We will have 10 minutes each of prepared opening statements, and then each of you guys will be able to go through five minutes of rebuttals each, and then I will ask two questions for each of you, and we'll rotate between you guys. You'll each have five minutes to answer the question I've directed towards you, and the other person will have three minutes to respond, and then we will have a 30-minute Q&A and crossfire where you guys will have questions from the audience, and you will also then be allowed to sort of go back and forth between the two of you. So you can kind of have fun with it. It'll be a complete free-for-all. So after that, we'll go for five minutes each for closings. And you guys are allowed to have prepared openings. And I will give you guys hand signals throughout so that we're all um, on time and so that everything is running smoothly. So let's get started uh, with the openings. It will be 10 minutes each. And we are going to start with Milo. Is that indigo? Yes. Okay. Um, I have to give you some credit for um, having the cojones to show up in Tennessee uh, barely a month after the bullet-ridden bodies of children have been buried as a sort of representative for a culture that did it and offering anything but condolences and sympathy. I think it's disgusting. I think it's shameful. How dare you? How dare you show up here offering anything but sympathy? Because, you know, I think, uh, I should have stand or something. Uh, we're familiar with what happened in Tennessee. We're less familiar with the reasons why. Um, but the reason was that at any given time in society, there are about 20% of people who are just fucking nuts. Um, and those people will glom on to whatever the fad is for people who are fucking nuts. Um, so the current fucking nuts is trannies. Uh, you can see in the social trends when you, uh, you plot uh, anorexia and bulimia, which was the big thing when I was growing up, against the new nuts. That there's basically about one in five people who are just not really all there and will kind of do whatever. When you hand those people, those unstable and dangerous people, a victimhood script, when you give them a license to commit violence in the name of their supposed identities, instead of giving them the treatment and the love and the prayers that they need, you turn those people into killers. You turn those people into uh, time bombs. And there used to be something in America that would protect against that. It was Christianity. I think it's shameful that anybody would show up so soon after a tragedy caused by the kind of ideologies that you support and do anything but offer sympathy and condolences and celebrate the ideology that has protected us against this sort of thing for so long. It's outside the scope of our evening this evening to uh, prove or disprove the, the truth of Christianity or or, or Christ or whatever, um, but I'll, I'll make a few points. Um, there is no America without Christ. And the reason for that is that um, this is an intrinsically and fundamentally Christian nationalist uh, country by which we mean it's built into the architecture of the nation. There's no getting away from it. You can lie about it, you can pridefully uh, claim that, you know, oh, you can be good people without Christ, you can't. Um, you're just inheriting uh, a system of good and evil from the culture uh, in which you grew up, which accords with the natural law. America was founded, as Adams told us, with a constitution that is wholly unsuited to the governance of anyone but a moral and religious people. And when he said religious, he meant Christian, although he himself was uh, uh, wandered through various different kinds of heresy. Um, 
what, what Adam said was that this country is, that it's, it's, it's founding documents, that it's founding architecture. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights were wholly and fundamentally unsuited to the governance of anything but a moral and religious people. Do you think that America uh, is comprised of a moral and religious people today? Obviously it is not. And what he meant specifically was Christianity because the way that America is set up outsources morality to Christianity. And without it, it doesn't work because jury trials don't work when people vote with race instead of conscience and truth. A uh, society doesn't work when people don't obey contracts, don't uh, obey their word, when they're oath breakers. The architecture of America rests fundamentally on a bedrock of Christianity without which the entire thing falls apart. And that's exactly what's happening. And you don't have to take my word for it, you don't even have to take Adams's word for it, but one of uh, your own Supreme Court justices, somebody who was uh, famously left-wing, Rehnquist, I think it was. I can't bother to look it up, but um, he said that everything in America presupposes the legal system, the social system, the government. Everything in America presupposes the existence of the Judeo-Christian God. Without that, it all comes tumbling down. And without that, it is coming tumbling down. And without that, we're not able to give people who have terrible uh, sicknesses and weaknesses and defects the help that they need. Instead, we hand them victimhood scripts and they shoot up schools, they shoot up uh, churches, whether they are young white guys on antidepressants or whether they're transgender people who are told that it's white Christians are responsible for all of, th all of their uh, miseries. It is Christianity that keeps us nice to each other, that keeps us being good to one another. And if you toss it out, as happened in 1776 here, you have a really big problem on your hands because and I'm going to say something very radical and difficult to say in Tennessee of, of all places. There are freedoms afforded to Americans that are too radical and too great and too daring without the insulation of Christianity. The First and Second Amendments don't work unless everyone's Christian. They don't work and they're not working. They're not functioning. You can't give crazy atheists guns. You can't let shameless liars say whatever they want about other people in public without consequence. There's a sort of, um, there's a sort of unwritten rule that sits behind everything in America, and it is that these are all the things you get to do because we know that you can handle it. We know that you can be trusted with this because you love God, because you respect life, because you won't take other people's lives, because you'll keep your word. Without that, the First and Second Amendments become a sort of license to abuse one another or to kill one another. They become a license to lie. They become a license to murder. They become too much freedom, because there is such a thing. And without an underpinning moral architecture, this country doesn't work, and it's not working. And since this country has fallen away from God, the Christian God, this country has begun to, begun to fall apart. And that's why all of this terrible shit is happening. That's why all the awful stuff on TV is going on. It's why you can no longer trust people to keep their words if you don't know them. It's why everybody keeps voting with their skin color or their sexuality or gender or whatever bollocks it is today. Because they're not unified under Christ, because they're not one under Christ, because they're not brothers and sisters in Christ. It doesn't matter if you agree with the literal truth of Christianity or not. The founders did, and they made a country for people who did. And if you don't agree with that, or you don't like God, or you don't see why too much freedom is leading us all to hate and kill each other, and you don't appreciate that we should not only restore Christianity in culture, 
but require it in public life. You should go to Canada. You should go somewhere else where there's a moral architecture built into the law. But here, it doesn't work without God. And when you don't have him, when instead people replace prayer and the rituals of the church with antidepressants, with compound interest, with games and drink and drug and drugs and fornication, kind of thing he does with his wife, you know, offering her around town like she's common property. <laughs> America doesn't work when we behave that way because we'll all just end up murdering each other. That's all. Destiny, you have 10 minutes. It's terrible. Every day I'm the uh, progressive. Oh, what? Here? Yeah? Oh, nice. Okay. I'm not used to arguing for more freedoms uh, against conservatives on stage, but I guess that's where we're at right now with the conservative movement or whatever part of the conservative movement this is. Um, today, we've got viewers gathered from all across the world tuning in to a debate between me and Milo, where Milo is going to argue that we should turn the USA into an isolated, authoritarian, zealously religious country. I think that technology is the Pandora's box that has changed this country and this world forever, and I don't think we're ever going back to the days of public squares and mail service by horse. Cultural, cultural exchange is happening, whether you like it or not, quite literally at the speed of light. Even right now, potentially hundreds of thousands or even millions of people around the world are listening to me and Milo have this debate. The only way to, type this, to stop this type of cultural exchange is through the militant authoritarianism that Milo is talking about on this stage. That might be through his being against the First Amendment, that might be against his taking away of the Second Amendment, and that might be through the institution of a state religion. This means the destruction of our freedom of speech, our ability to produce media, satire, and comedy, and our ability to communicate openly on the social media platforms we've all unfortunately grown addicted to. <clears throat> After Milo gets his way and abolishes the First Amendment, is he gonna be the one deciding who we can or cannot make fun of on Twitter? Is the world really going to return to how it was before, before birth control, before women had the right to work, before, before gay people were allowed to get married, before we were allowed the ability to freely worship whatever God we wanted or abstain from worship altogether? I reckon that we cannot close Pandora's box. Christian nationalism, as it stands today, isn't even a coherent ideology. The proponents will argue whether there's an ethnic component, whether one needs to be Catholic or not, and whether one needs to even be a Christian or a supporter at all in order to idolize uh, somebody for a Christian nationalist ideology. How many more porn stars does Donald Trump need to work his way through behind his wife's back before Christian nationalists stop worshiping him as their savior? As small as Christian nationalism is as a movement, even with it being as small as it is, there is still endless infighting. Anyone who's taken a gander recently at Milo, Ali Alexander, or Fuentes' Telegram account can attest to that. And now, with an already fractured and fighting minority movement, some want to put even more restrictions, such as race, lineage, sex sexuality, LGBT status, or geography, on who ought to be allowed to join their movement. The glory days of Christianity are largely over. While the number of worshipers have ebbed and flowed through time, it's impossible for us to return to where we came from. In 1999, almost 70% of Americans were part of a church, synagogue, or mosque. And just 20 years later, in 2020, according to Pew Research, that number has fallen to just 47%, a minority of the population for the first time in U.S. history. We need to be realistic about the coming years. We need to help our young men and women find purpose in the world and stop pretending like some Christian nationalism is the answer. We need to find ways to get our young people engaged with their friends, family, and their communities in ways that synergize with the technological explosion the entire world has experienced. If Christian nationalists want to continue to practice Christianity in America, then I say we let them. However, we should never allow them to take away our right not to do the same. We will now have five minutes of rebuttals from each of you guys. So we'll start with Milo. You have five minutes. Thank you. If the movement, uh, such as it is, I didn't realize there was one, but um, if, if Christian nationalism is not yet adequately defined, it's because nobody used it before two years ago. 
um, which it seems to me to be perfectly reasonable. Trump is not a religious leader in any sense, and you're making a classic mistake of people who don't understand religion, don't understand God, and don't understand their own country when you say, uh, hold Trump up as a kind of moral example. Render unto Caesar. We don't expect that our presidents should be like Jesus because they're not here to do Jesus's job. Um, so, no. Um, it's interesting you talk about women's rights. I mean, Christianity is the... <laughs> Sorry, I mean... <laughs> You know, I just don't know how hard to go in, really. I mean, uh, you know, you're talking about the religion that gave women uh, consent in marriage. You're talking about the religion that gave women the right to say no, that elevated them from chattel into human beings. You want to return women to chattel. You want women to be like your wife, passed around town. I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm not going to take moral lectures on the rights of women from somebody who treats their, supposedly, their wife in what ought to be a holy sacrament, as a communal sex toy. Give me a break. Give me a break. I'm not going to take moral lectures from somebody who, for all intents and purposes, may as well have a fleshlight instead of a wife, who demeans and besmirches her honor, who speaks about a woman who should be treated with the reverence and respect and love that we treat our own mothers with, like she was something you could buy, like she's something that just, just to get off with, passed around to other men while you watch, flicking yourself off. <laughs> so forgive me if I decline to take any lectures from you on women's bloody rights. As for gay rights, no thanks. <laughs> I didn't want them when I was having sex with men and I don't want them now. Catholicism and Islam are growing, in case you aren't familiar with the world outside these borders. And the reason for that is that everybody sees what a bloody mess we're all in, thanks to globalization, thanks to the information economy, thanks to the kinds of changes that he says are inexorable, because like a lot of undereducated people, he doesn't have much of a grasp of the world before he was born. Um, I think if you were to uh, glance a little further back, whether it were to ancient Greece or Rome or the Holy Roman Empire, you would see plenty of examples in history or even, dare I say it, the Weimar Republic. A little bit closer to our own era, in which an era of rampant sexual degeneracy was indeed replaced by some quite stern social rules, to put it mildly. History is replete with examples of uh, what happens when the public gets sick of people like you, fucking everything up, breaking everything apart, and destroying all the things that make society precious, that make relationships work. In fact, if you are to look back in history as far as Greece and Rome, you might say that history is really the story of how people like you given undue influence and larger platforms than they deserve, um, continually express views that are so far outside of the mainstream and so out of step with what ordinary people think that you have to be regularly slaughtered and new governments have to be installed and coups have to be uh, 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 engaged in just to keep people like you in line because otherwise we'd all be dead. So I'm sorry, but I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to take any kind of moral lectures from you on anything. But I've given you a few examples of why everything you just said is complete and absolute nonsense. But let me tell you, um, if your memory stretches back, uh, and as you're at university, you're an educated person, it should be further than 1980. Uh, yeah, you absolutely can put it back in the box. And we must, and we should, because otherwise America is done. All right. Destiny, you have five minutes for your rebuttal. <laughs> I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to respond to. Um, I think it's a little funny that um, apparently I'm so far outside of what people regularly think, despite the fact that I'm pretty sure I'm giving you a bigger audience than you've had in the past several years post your cancellation. Um, <clears throat> but I see that um, this is this is what the uh, this is what the dying this is what the uh, dying throes, I guess, of an internet provocateur, as he self-described himself, back when you were writing on the alt right and when you were writing on Trump. Now, when you're, I guess you're not writing on guys anymore, because apparently you prayed away the gay, so whatever you're doing now. Um, but I won't get into all that. I will, uh, I'll take the high road, despite the fact that 
you're one of the most obsessed with my wife's vagina gay guys I've ever seen in my entire life, which is very fucking weird, but um, very strange. Um, I'll kind of reiterate what I said before, I guess. I don't know how long we're going to do this, but yeah, I think that Christian nationalism is largely a joke. Um, I guess you can kind of see that the figures that are proponents of Christian nationalism, like Christian nationalism, are largely jokes. They don't really have any serious positions. They just sit up here trying to provoke. They really have nothing to offer the public, nothing to offer the public discourse, nothing to offer the people that are, um, I guess, trying to join and leave these movements because obviously, as we can see online, they are ever fracturing and ever infighting more and more every single day. Um, yeah. All right. We'll move on to the questions right now. Uh, the person who I will direct the question towards has five minutes to respond, and then the opponent has three minutes to respond to that. Then the first question is for Milo. As we know, Christianity has a lot of denominations, and even amongst your faith, Catholicism, there are lots of conflicting interpretations of the Bible and, and other uh, differing opinions. How would you, in your Christian nationalist society, coexist with non-Catholics? Uh, you don't have to... I mean... <laughs> my patron saint, um, Louis IX, the only canonized king of France, um, says that uh, he knows what's coming already. Uh, <laughs> uh, there must be Elijah, I've been warned about you. Um, it said that, um, you know, it wasn't really proper for, uh, for, to, to, to debate these kinds of things. And, um, you know, it's better to, to run somebody through with a sword than to, uh, uh, than to, to hear them uh, brish much the faith or whatnot. Um, but if you think that uh, coexistence with Christians uh, is such an onerous and dreadful burden, um, perhaps you might like to tell the Jews uh, who seem to quite like it. Uh, in fact, Jews and Christians, it seems to me, do best uh, in the sort of situation that you have in the West with a Christian governing majority uh, and a Jewish minority so that we don't all get too super serious and uh, up ourselves. And, you know, we have some good new interpretations of Mendelssohn now and again. Um, I, I, <sighs> there aren't any conflicting uh, interpretations of the Bible in Catholicism. There is only uh, church teaching, and church teaching is, is uh, eternal. Um, unless some pope comes along and, and decides that uh, even Francis hasn't done that, that he's going to rip it all up. Um, coexisting with Christians is the easiest thing to do in the world. Um, and uh, I can't remember who gave this example, but if you heard footsteps, this is not my, not my analogy, but if you heard footsteps coming up behind you uh, in a dark alley at night, would you feel safer if you knew that it was um, uh, Dylan Mulvaney or any church-going Christian? All right, for Dustin, you have three minutes now to respond to that. Can you, I'm sorry, can you read the prompt again? Yeah, sure. As we know, Christianity has a lot of denominations. <laughs> Even amongst your faith, Catholicism, Milo's faith, uh, there are lots of conflicting interpretations of the Bible. How would your Christian national society coexist with non-Catholics? Well, I mean, the society that I advocate for is the one that exists today where people are allowed to worship whatever religion they want. I think that right now, America is superior to a Christian nationalist version of it because if two different people decide they want to worship two different versions of Christianity, they have the right to do that. Obviously, in Milo's world, I guess the non-Catholics even, I think, would get killed. I don't know how many, where the, the killing what starts the and stops um, for his version of Christian nationalism or ethnically, anyone? I don't know where that starts or stops. I heard the run through the sword thing. Maybe you forgot what you said. I'm not sure what you were doing in the bathroom while we were waiting for you for 20 minutes here, but um, <laughs> maybe it's affecting your memory a little bit. It's but yeah, I think in the United States, I think one of the reasons right why the United States works as well as it does is because we've allowed so many different people to come here, worship in the way that we want, or worship in the way that they want, and we should continue to allow them to do so. 40 minutes is a terribly long time to do a line of coke. <laughs> I was late. The good, I was... <laughs> I, was I was late for the ordinary reasons that people are late. I was at the hairdresser. <laughs> All right, Destiny. Yeah, I have the personality I have. I'm sort of stuck with it now. Um, now your question, Destiny. Uh, you have five minutes to respond to this, and then I'll have three minutes to respond to that. Some would argue that a society without religion at its core would devolve into a nihilistic society 
deprived of any meaning or purpose, how would you prevent in your society, non-Christian nationalist governing society, from devolving into a nihilistic, meaningless society? I think that you have to have something greater than yourself to live for, and I think religion is like a really easy package to give somebody that kind of solves for a lot of those problems. Um, it gives you a nice guide for how to view the world, it gives you a nice guide for how to view your family, it gives you a nice guide for how to live an ethical life, and through that package, people feel like they have something greater than themselves to live for. I don't think it's impossible to have that thing without religion, but I think right now we're very politically fractured as a country, and it makes it really difficult for us to have those things. Um, so for instance, there are certain topics that are hotly contested that I don't think should be. So for instance, all of us should be able to say we're proud to be Americans. That includes progressives, that includes BLM people, that includes people on the left, that includes anybody that might, you know, however far left you go, you should be able to say that. That shouldn't be ground that we cede uh, to, to people on the right. I think it's kind of a shame that if you see an American flag on somebody's car today, you basically know that they're a conservative because nobody on the left would put that on their car. I think that's an insane proposition. So I think that when we've gotten to this point to where we're so politically divided that people can't even feel proud of their country anymore, if you also take away religion from those people too, then they're kind of aimlessly, I guess, wandering from Twitter to Facebook to YouTube to whatever, just endlessly shitting on each other with no common united purpose. So I think that one of the things we need to work on more than anything else is, is kind of healing some of the political fracture that exists in this country. I think it's good that we argue with each other, um, but it's not good that we are relentlessly banning people from every platform so that we're all kind of like gathering in different areas and we're not even able to have conversations with each other in the same reality anymore. Milo, you have three minutes. Isn't, um, isn't endlessly... Isn't endlessly careening from one person to the other, shitting on each other, um, what you do for a living? For lemons, for handouts. Um, there, there aren't good societies unless people um, agree on a common set of values. And I'm afraid that freedom, democracy, and the American dream haven't cut it, have they? Uh, and you don't need to really be a Christian. I'm certainly not going to attempt to persuade anybody this evening. I'm not in the business of evangelization. I quite like that about Judaism, actually. It's like, no, we don't want you. Uh, but that's not, that's not the Christian way. So. But um, just look at the societies that Christians build. I mean, earlier he says, oh, you know, you get rid of, uh, get rid of the First Amendment, and there goes satire. Again, apparently a memory that doesn't stretch back before 1980. Because I think most of the best satirists were Christian Europeans, weren't they? And before that, they were pagans. And, you know, we live in a very Hellenistic kind of a inheritance. And it was just, just complete and total bollocks. Um, and you've been doing a lot of complete and total bollocks, assigning so positions to me that I don't hold. And uh, saying, oh, he wants to murder everyone. He wants to kill all the blacks. Um, no. No. Um, look at the societies that Christians build. Look at the things they build. In Catholic theology, um, there's a thing called the transcendentals, and it's uh, supposedly um, the things that all souls have in common, that all uh, people yearn for, and which brings us closer to an understanding of God. Uh, now, opinions differ on how many of these things there are, but the, the core three that everyone agrees on is beauty, truth, and goodness. And it seems to me that if you look at the frescoes in Italy, or you listen to German composers or look at Dutch painting, that we in Western Christian Europe have done a pretty good job of embracing beauty, truth, and goodness, and also self-sacrifice and sacrifice for love, which is the central image of Christianity. For, uh, Feuerbach, the philosopher who was not a Christian, um, did not like Christians at all, said that you, know, um, you can sort of tell uh, what a culture is all about from its, its religion's kind of central symbol. Ours is Christ on the cross. Dying for someone you love. It's Tristan and Isolde. It's all the things that we think are most noble. It's sending people to war to die for their country. All of those values, all those things we love, rest on the image of Christ on the cross. We are good only because we have learned goodness from Christianity. And we can insist in a prideful way that, oh, no, no, I'm good because I made myself good because I got there through reason. All right, mate. Just look at the societies that Christians build, and you tell me where you want to live. Is it Abu Dhabi? Is it the Congo? Is it Sparta? Or is it Western Europe, maybe 50 years ago? I know where I'd rather be. All right, last question for Milo, and you'll have five minutes to respond to this, and Destiny will have three minutes to respond to that. 
Some would argue that societies governed under one faith can devolve into tyranny. How would you prevent a second inquisition or a Soviet-style dictatorship with them forcing people to proclaim their allegiance to the state and faith? Well, the Soviets are crap because they failed. I mean, they failed to do what America has accomplished, which is uh, have people thank you for their enslavement and ask for more chains. The Soviet Union never really achieved that, but America has with prescription drugs and uh, all the other things that people are addicted to. I mean, everybody in this room is dependent on a, a, a cocktail, a little package, it'll consume a package of things that get them through, whether it's their credit cards or gaming or whatever, uh, uh, um, passing your wife around. Um, these are the things that sort of get you through life. Um, I'm not terribly concerned about preventing another inquisition. I think it'd be quite a good idea. Um, got a pretty bad rap, just like the Crusades does. I mean, you won't hear this from uh, dishonest people who throw accusations at, uh, you know, without really listening to the arguments of their opponents and who aren't educated prior to 1980, but um, the Crusades were a defensive war. The Inquisition wasn't all that it's been said to be. Um, I don't have an enormous problem with us uh, wandering around and making sure people aren't murdering each other in the womb and, uh, and, and, and making, you know, sitting back and making money off the poor, uh, you know, landlords in Brooklyn. Um, I, don't, I don't have a terrible problem with that. Um, you know, I don't think that protecting against tyranny is the thing that America should be most concerned with at the moment. I think an urgent, strict, and perhaps stern realignment to a, a much more conventional morality would make everybody happier. And I don't think that anyone in this room can honestly say that America is better now than it was when most people were going to church or at least God-fearing. It isn't better. And you don't have to be a Christian to participate in a Christian society. Christians are the best of all at letting people in, sometimes too much. Sometimes the people that come in end up messing everything up. You don't have to be a Christian to benefit from a Christian society, and lots of people in this room have done exactly that. Uh, but when you take God out and, and you know, things start to fall apart, you end up in a world nobody wants to live in. What and we are in. Sorry? What do you mean? Oh, well, I mean, if I had my way, I'd go back to about 1,200. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, lots of, lo lo I mean, uh, lots of propagandists in university departments call it the Dark Ages. Um, you know, well, this is a conversation from the other day, really, but um, it seems to me it was uh, quite, quite a nice time to live. And uh, I think that you would find, if you care about this kind of thing, if you do care about things above and beyond yourself, if you care about where we go afterwards, if you care about leaving a good legacy, if you care about being good to the people around you. I think a lot more people in 1400 got into heaven each year than do now. And I don't think you have to be a Christian to accept that that's because we're not nice anymore and we're not good to each other. And the reason for that is the failing moral architecture and underpinning of society, which was required by the founders or this stuff doesn't function and it's not. All right, Destiny, you have three minutes to respond. Can you hit me up with that prompt again? Some would argue that societies governed under one faith can devolve into tyranny. How would you prevent a second inquisition or a Soviet-style dictatorship where people have to proclaim their allegiance to the state and faith? Uh, I mean, it's kind of a hard question for me to answer because I'm not advocating for Christian nationalism, but I would say, obviously, we should be allowed to carry on as we are now, where everybody's allowed to choose what God they want to worship, choose the lifestyle they want to live, as long as they're not encroaching on the freedoms of other people. I think you should continue to have the right to do that. So it's my argument in the negative. Also, I do think it's kind of funny that Milo pointed out that everybody in here is addicted to consumerist packaging, when I'm pretty sure that bag is worth like 10 times more than my entire outfit. It is. It is. All right, now we will do the last question for you, Destiny, and then we'll go to the Q&A slash Crossfire. Some would argue that most people are naturally drawn to some sort of faith or belief in a higher power. How would you prevent your society from inevitably becoming a religious society and thus being run by the exact same organizing faith or ideas that you want to stop? 
Um, I mean, I think that the important, I think the important thing is for people to have something bigger than themselves to live for. I don't think it has to be religion, but if it was religion, I don't necessarily think that's the worst thing in the world. I think that the defining aspect of the United States is that a lot of people with contradictory ideas can exist within the same geographic borders, governed by the same legal system, voting on the same politicians, and somehow finding a way to make all of that work. I think we've done it for hundreds of years. I think we do it better than any other country on the planet. Right now, today, not before 1980, not in the 1200s, but today in 2023, I think we have an incredibly diverse country of people, all sorts of creeds, all sorts of ethnicities, all sorts of different types of people that seem to be living together and making it work. I think we have problems right now, like I mentioned earlier, with the political division. I think that that's a real problem that we need to combat, but I think we need to do it by having honest conversations about what we can do to move forward, not by talking to people that want to look back hundreds or thousands of years to what society used to look like before there was Gucci and hairdressers. I could live without both um, if it meant that you would be left on a mountainside somewhere, your parents wondering which god they'd pissed off, which is exactly what would have happened in a pre-Christian civilization to something like you. Probably would have left the gays um, there before people like me. I don't think you can tell when it pops out whether it's going to like cock or not. Um, maybe if it's your kid, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll ensure that's the case. Um, I mean, you'd know all about kids liking dick, huh? Is that, isn't that <laughs> would I? Would I? Would, would I? Tell us more about that. Would I? Because that's a pretty big fucking allegation. Would I? Would you what? Would I know about that? Well, seems like it. Isn't that what you got cancelled for? No, I got cancelled for talking about the fact that I was a victim of clerical sexual abuse. I was... So about, like, little boys liking dick, right? Oh, I see. Okay. Well, yeah. There I mean, go. Uh, you got there eventually. It's okay. Yeah, okay. I can right. tell you're coming down right now, but... I'll walk you through the rest of my jokes if you need me to. No, I, no, I, I fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, okay, are you bringing it? Fine, fine, fine. Shame for Father Michael's daddy would have liked that. Um, I think if um, I, I don't know that it makes me an expert on on uh, kids liking dick being raped by a priest, but um, you, if you want some comedy lessons afterwards, I'm happy to uh, give you twenty minutes. What was the question? I'm sorry, I was so bored. Uh, question was, some would argue that most people are naturally drawn some sort of faith or belief in a higher power. How would you, Destiny, prevent your society from inevitably becoming a religious society and thus being run by the same right. organizing Thanks. faith ideas? I think it's a bit lazy to say, as people often do, um, that we now have a kind of alternate sort of progressive religion. I don't think that progressivism really functions like a religion. It's true that when you take God out of things, you don't just sort of, you know, get rid of him in the same way that when you get rid of a king, you don't really get rid of the king. You still are ruled by people that you can't, that you have no power over. The difference is that in America, you don't know their names because they look behind that flag rubbing their hands and uh, making money off you and getting you addicted to things. You don't know their names, so you can't assassinate them. One reason monarchy is better. Um, I think, uh, sorry, I forgot one question. Oh, it was about um, uh, uh, how do you prevent it from sliding in. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's lazy when people say, uh, oh, we've replaced kind of, you know, one religion with a progressive religion. Um, it's true that when God moves out that um, other things move in. You don't just kind of get rid of it and now everyone's happy and now everyone can just be nice to each other. Um, that, that yearning that you've acknowledged that we all have has got to be satisfied by something. So if you take the Christian God out, something worse moves in because there isn't anything better than that. There isn't anything uh, better than that for organizing society. There isn't anything better than that for teaching people how to behave to one another. There isn't anything better than that uh, objectively, practically, and uh, empirically. So um, things do move in, but progressivism of the type that he likes doesn't function like a religion because all religions have one thing in common that his political orthodoxy doesn't, and that's salvation and forgiveness because there is no forgiveness for uh, people who are cancelled, um, whether or not they were responsible for what happened to them and were trying to make sense of an abuse experience or whether they said something that they shouldn't have said. There's no, back, there's no way back. There's no, there's no forgiveness. There's no redemption. And that's the thing all religions except for this orthodoxy seem to have in common. So I don't think it's, I think it's a bit lazy to say that um, one religion gets replaced by another. But it is definitely true that um, you cannot simply chop off the top of the pyramid and expect everything to be fine. Something worse will slither its way up there. And it has. Thank you guys so much. Let's give everybody, the both of them, a round of applause, please.
now we're going to move into the audience Q&A. So if you'd like to ask a question, line up behind me. We'll have somebody hold a mic here, and you're allowed to ask one question. And we'll have probably about 30 minutes this. If we want to go a little longer, we can. But we'll try to keep it to 30 minutes. All right, so in like a potential Christian nationalist uh, or like theocratic U.S., what would kind of the government policy on smoking indoors be? <laughs> Is that there's like something, permitted? There's, some, there's, something, there's something odd about smoking. Smoking's the only thing that's bad for you that the government doesn't promote. See, that's kind of what I think. Yeah, yeah, there's something up with that. I, I, I feel like maybe like on the low, smoking's really good for you. Um, and they just don't want us to know, and cancer yeah. comes from like the TV or something, because there's no You're on to something. Yeah, that's something. Whatever you know. No, uh, there's a, it's 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 bad vibes or the devils or something. But um, there's something weird about the fact that smoking is the only thing that kills you that the government doesn't subsidize and encourage. See, yeah, I've always found that to be kind of questionable. I, I think know. smoking is extremely based, and oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can yeah. tell you, um, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt. Certainly in my faith tradition. Um, the early church fathers were very enthusiastic about alcohol, mm -hmm. um, uh, in moderation, of course, uh, although moderation had a slightly different meaning in the 1200s. Um, so uh, I think they would be um, uh, lighting up the marble right next to you. All right. Well, awesome. Destin, do you have anything, any sort of opinion on that? Or? Well, I kind of like smoking being banned from indoors, I'm going to be honest. Uh, Fair enough. Somebody that is, uh, I didn't 30 live it. I didn't live it. So. Do, yeah. As somebody that's 34, uh, the older people in here will remember for restaurants we had no smoking sections. They definitely didn't work. Um, I don't mind people smoking, I, I guess, like, outside if they want to smoke, but having to share spaces with just disgusting cigarette smoke, like, constantly wafting through the air, especially if you've got kids around and stuff, I think it's really disgusting, so I'm glad it's gone from inside. You sort of get used to it, though. I mean, it's, the only reason to visit Germany after 1945, really, uh, is the fact that you can smoke while you're having a, while you're having a coffee. Um, you it's know. a lot of drugs you can get used to, but I don't know if you're a good argument in favor of that. No, no, I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying that there's... Uh, you know, there are certain things that, that you can't necessarily argue from first principles convincingly, but nonetheless seem to work better, uh, like monarchy and smoking. All right, well, fair enough. Thank you, guys. Uh, hi, my, uh, I clawed one person back, you see. You see? I'm, I'm so glad someone brought up smoking because I really needed a Marlboro Red coming in here. And I was like, God, okay. It's hardcore. It's hardcore. It's hardcore. I'm, I'm a Newport Lights guy. Oh, you know. okay, right. Smoke right, for right. the man you want, as From was. John, maybe. You know. yeah. uh, but I, I wanted to ask you, Milo, um, it's a question on speech. And the first one was, mm. what happened to make America hate again? I was looking forward to that book. I was telling all my friends and family about it. And yes. Then it didn't come out. I, I kept getting employed by people, um, but I've written most of it. Um, and uh, I think it's become actually more urgent than ever. There's a particular understanding of hate, which I, I think the, the, the left uh, fails to make this distinction, probably on purpose uh, a lot of the time. Um, you'll hear Christians sometimes say, you know, uh, hate, the, hate the sin and love the sinner. Um, what they mean by that is that people are what they do. People are their conscious choices, right? Uh, so we shouldn't hate people because they were born a particular ethnicity or gender or whatever, obviously, you know, unless they're French. Um, <laughs> but... What we should instead do is uh, judge them by what they choose to do, right? So people are their actions. And uh, psychology is now catching up with religion. It's, uh, you know, there's no gay men on forms anymore. It's men who have sex with men. Uh, so psychology is kind of catching up with this idea that we are what we choose to do. Um, we can hate what people do, the choices they make, and the evil that they perpetuate without hating them as human beings, as children of God. Uh, and I think it's become more urgent than ever that we, um, that we I think, rehabilitate hate. Um, and I definitely have been encouraged to get that bloody project finished uh, because I think it's, it's more urgently needed than ever. We ought to be able to look at something abhorrent and say, I hate it. I hate it. Uh, pow powerfully, I hate it passionately, I hate it with every fiber of my being, and I'll fight it, and I'll stop it, and I'll die for it. Uh, you know, I'll die to, to, to you know, to, to, to get rid of it. Um, and, uh, you know, the kind of lifestyle he, he leads, you know, is, is the sort of thing that I think it's okay to hate. It's a conscious choice that hurts everyone, that leaves lives ruined, um, that, uh, well, you can see the results. Um, that I think it's okay to hate, although I am commanded to love him as, uh, you know, a fellow man as a Christian, which, you know, I'm working on. That, that brought me to the substance of well, what I wanted to ask you. Oh, just on a real quick thing, because you didn't really answer that question. If you want to know when his next book is coming out, you should ask the guy that actually writes them. 
I have to believe Milo writes them. I'm a big fan, and they're all fabulous. Anyway. Um, I think, you know, like, given that I, w I write about 10,000 words a week on Telegram, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that I might throw a book together once every two and a half years, which is roughly when I get around to doing them. But you tried. And it's a, it's a great Telegram, almost better than Tucker. Uh, okay, it is better than Tucker. But what I wanted to get to is with, with blasphemy. Yeah. Um, are blasphemy laws the proper way to um, have a First Amendment, but also keep it from corrupting itself? Yes. I think you need a deterrent um, to remind people what it is that keeps everything hold, uh, held together. Uh, and I think if somebody goes out repeatedly, deliberately, uh, blaspheming the name of our Lord, um, you should expect to have your tongue cut out, or worse, because that's the thing that keeps it, everything together. Um, in just the way that Americans get very touchy when flags, t uh, you know, uh, uh, graze the floor and stuff like that. It's a perfectly reasonable anxiety to have because the flag is a sort of, you know, crap proxy for the things that really matter. Um, I think it's perfectly reasonable to have those things sacrosanct, and America does. It just picks stupid shit instead of the right things. Thank you. Hello. Um, so, Milo, you have identified yourself as an ex-gay, and you have also advocated for conversion therapy yes, and please. making it to where um, it is more, I guess, acceptable to the media or presenting a more positive light of conversion. I don't much care if journalists like it or not. I just want to save souls, but go on. Yeah. So I just wanted to know how you plan, like, on making it to be seen as, like, more positive in the media, just because a lot of studies have shown that conversion therapy is traumatic for... No, um, no, they haven't. Um, <laughs> if you recall, uh, it, even, even the most left-wing... Uh, well, that, that, that ridiculous... I mean, okay, you, the strongest argument you have is that uh, Biden, the nuclear tranny, uh, the one whose job was dealing with spent rods, ho-ho, um, uh, who used to steal luggage from uh, from from uh, the, the from that there was that lovely was it a Nairobi woman what was she a uh, fashion designer um, that that tranny that I mean you know, your first clue was he's wearing women's clothes maybe not somebody you want around nuclear material um, but uh, your your strongest argument is he went through conversion therapy but of course on film he said it worked and he liked it uh, so the, the testimony is a bit unreliable in this area and the, uh, I think most of the reason for that is that it doesn't work all the time and the majority of t uh, it doesn't work most of the time actually uh, the best that most people can hope for is celibacy and I think that disappointment is what drives a lot of the negative testimony afterwards um, I think that it works in in conversion therapy's favor that it's hated um, and I, if you find it ridiculous for me to say that, um, you know, th that it's a, a good thing that works, there isn't a person in this room who can honestly say, the press treated Donald Trump totally fairly in 2016. Even if you were on the other side, everybody now agrees, as sure as, you know, they agree on the color of the sky. Right. Well, the first, but if, you if the first, answered but my the first, I, but I'm, 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 well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. The first time that something was given that treatment, the treatment that Trump's had, um, was in the first uh, episode of political correctness in the 1990s. So in the 1990s, there was a sort of brief flash of political correctness that was quite quickly put down um, by uh, counter, the counterculture. It came back with a vengeance later. We now live in it. Um, but in that first brief flash of political correctness, that's when you had uh, the old ladies with the big hair on TV saying that, you know, uh, Marilyn Manson causes uh, 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 massacres at school, which I find, you know, just as ridiculous as people who say that video games cause school shooters, um, uh, just as ridiculous as people who say that, you know. Thank you. Well, I'm trying to, not everything has a two-word answer. But I think it does. All I just want to know is how you plan on... Like, well, if you knew the answer, you wouldn't be asking me. Well, yeah, but you I just think we're keep done. Thank going you. in circles. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, so, Destiny, I just want to say I'm a long-time viewer and fan. Hey, what's up? Uh, nice, uh, nice to see you in person. Um, as far as uh, the all the shit you get about your wife, threesomes are based, dog, so have your fun. <laughs> um, anyway, so my question. Um, so... We, you guys seem to be implying that under Christian nationalism, things would get better. Well, he does. Things get better. I, would, I assume that means like crime and things like that. Uh, how do you reconcile that with the fact that like 
uh, a lot of the like, prison population is very low atheist counts and uh, dominantly Christian, and a lot of uh, countries like Japan and over in Europe are less religious, and they seem to be more pleasant places to live. So if either of you guys have something to contribute on that, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I think that religion probably has a really complicated interaction with a person's life in a way that could either predispose you towards crime or could not predispose you, or predispose you against crime or be a protective factor against crime. Um, so, for instance, if you grew up like in a religious family where religion is like a centerpiece of the family, but it's also built out to where you've got like a strong mother and father or two parents in the household, you've got like a good community of people that also also worship. Like in these types of situations, like I'm sure that religion probably functions as some kind of protective factor against like committing crime and whatnot. Um, but if you look at like prison populations, you know where people go and they eventually convert, or a lot of um, you know a lot of people can be violent and still you know wear a rosary, which you're not supposed to do, or wear a chain or something that has a cross on it. Um, I think sometimes you can scapegoat religion to do horrible things. Um, I think that it probably just depends on your engagement with your religion. You know, I, like I kind of view it as an instrument, a tool. You can either do good things through it, um, like the unbelievable amount of charitable givings and community involvement that churches have, or you can do horrible things with it, like people flying into buildings or going on mass shootings or, you know, what have you. Did you say you're not supposed to wear rosaries? Uh, as a, have, you as never, a Catholic? have you never been to Italy? No, but I was a Catholic no, for yeah, like 16 okay. years, and uh, wearing a rosary was a good. big no-no. We got in big trouble in school when we did that. But. The answer to your question is race. Um, the reason that there's no crime in Japan is it's entirely racially homogenous and wealthy. That's the answer. Uh, the reason that there's a lot of crime in this country is that America messed up emancipation. What racist commits a crime? Uh, I think we know. Um, but there's a reason for that. There's a reason. Well, I'm, let me get to it. Let me get to it. You can clip the good thing. In the, this, all right. this country messed up emancipation. What happened in the UK was that, uh, and it feels gruesome to us now to speak in these terms, but uh, property owners, um, sorry to say, were compensated for their losses. To put it um, you know, in, in those terms, uh, in a sense, emancipation in Europe was a kind of eminent domain where even if people wanted to grumble about it, they couldn't really say too much because they had got the market value for their house so that the railway could be built. Um, in America, they dragged it on for generations. They didn't uh, do that, and then through a combination of incompetence and malice, um, I th the, the, you know, blacks and whites were set against each other in this country, um, with the result that there is now a, a permanently um, grievance-focused 13% of the population, I mean, you know, maybe one percent of the, you know, black Americans don't hate everything and everyone, uh, but the, the rest of them are predisposed toward um, uh, antisocial behaviors because they were never welcomed into the pact. They were never properly welcomed into the American deal. They were never properly given a seat at the table, and they were never properly uh, welcomed in, with the result that they immediately, after emancipation, because emancipation was messed up, started voting with their race. They never were welcomed into the American deal, into the pact. They never bought into the values, and they never participated in the process of being American citizens. Um, so they didn't feel bound by the obligations that other Americans had towards one another, like jury trials should be based on the facts and not on whether he's black. Um, so as a result of things that were done to them a very long time ago, black America is now uh, in a situation where they're sort of permanently petulant child constantly lashing out at uh, a mixture of real and imagined grievances. Um, and the answer to your question about crime is simply that it's race. It's got nothing to do with religion. Uh, just an interesting uh, ad addition to that. Two researchers, Whitehead and Perry, I don't know if the stat would come in handy, but uh, black Americans are actually the largest ethnic group in the United States to support some form of Christian nationalism, which I think is really funny after all of that. Uh, yeah, and you know, there's the reason, there are reasons for that. I mean, you know, you've got you've got people who uh, look. It's it's mostly to do with where black people were and who was there too. So in the South, whether it's Georgia, which is uh, traditionally English, or Tennessee, which is more Scots Irish, um, you've got uh, more enthusiastic and more Anglican and more uh, religion that stuck more from um, basically the Anglosphere versus some of the Dutch places. Uh, Amer you know, there's a very good book um, uh, called American Nations, which kind of explains by uh, Colin Woodard that sort of explains the different character of the various chunks of America. Um, the main reason black America um, it remains somewhat religious, uh, although the church going doesn't necessarily translate into behavioral, uh, into behavior or social attitudes these days. Why not? Um, 
Well, because they're heretics, because they go to churches that are completely and utterly bonkers, because they don't go to uh, preachers who tell them about God. They're Pentecostals or Crystal Methodists uh, or some other kind of nonsense. Uh, the, reason, the, reason that they're, the reason that they're uh, not behaving as Christians is because they're not really Christians. Um, but the main reason that they are religious in, at all is just where they were and how they were when everything came to an end. The funniest thing is I actually just made that up. I was seeing if he would actually try to talk his way through that, but I, I totally made that up. Thanks, Milo. Thank you both. It doesn't, it, it doesn't surprise me for a very simple reason, which is that it was black voters who, over, uh, who resisted the proposition in California about gay marriage. It's not a ridiculous, it's not a ridiculous thing. It's not a gotcha to say that uh, blacks are, so, uh, are socially conservative. You can make some of the same arguments about Hispanics. Um, now, the kind of Catholicism they practice is you know, all mixed up with the hoodoo, voodoo, bruja nonsense, but um, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not in any way a ridiculous thing to say, given that in California, of all places, it was black voters who stopped gay marriage passing. I mean, it's just, just not a particularly peculiar thing to say. Wouldn't surprise me at all. In fact, one of the reasons that um, they have to work so hard to get black people into universities is that they don't teach anything that black people actually care about, and one of those is God. Property rights, bicycle chains, I don't know. What happens when you die? That's a good question. It's a great question. I'd like an answer. You might you. find out soon if this uh, <laughs> I event carries on its current trajectory. Uh, well, one of us I just will, want I your guess. personal opinion. Um, I, personal. I have no idea, to be honest. It's a thing I don't concern myself with. Um, I, the way that I view it is that like we've got one That's life fun. on this planet. We've got a bunch of people on this planet. There's going to be people that are come after us. I feel like it's good to kind of like put all your efforts into making this life as good as you can for yourself and the people around you. Um, if you want to fixate on like an afterlife or wonder what comes after, I think that's fine. But don't make too many sacrifices for like a guaranteed life here for a hypothetical, you know, afterlife tomorrow. In all fairness, I think we can I all no see the results. You were when I uh, came here, so just out of curiosity, are you an atheist? Um, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Hmm. What is nothing? Um, that's what, a very that? challenging question. A lot of people I have talked to about <laughs> mm -hmm. it say that nothingness is black, right? But that's something, isn't it? So the, the, the challenge of the question is actually in the, the, the words that you use to ask the question betray like how complicated a question is. So for instance, when you say, what is it like to experience nothingness? Or what is a thing? Like what is, it, what is nothingness? Well, the, the question presupposes a subject that can observe the nothingness. When you ask what is something, you're saying what is it like to observe something? Or what is it like for somebody to observe something? But obviously if there's nothing, there's not an observer there to observe it. So the question is a bit meaningless. I can't answer what it's like for somebody not to exist and then for that non-existent person's subjective experience of nothingness to be. Like, there's no way for me to like meaningfully answer the question. There's no way for any of us to answer that I've been question, retired too long to understand that. But the answer has been delivered to us don't, a long um, time ago. Don't people... I'm sorry, he went like three seconds without talking, so... I'm don't, yeah, when you don't, don't people uh, equate nothingness and, and black because of darkness and you can't see things at night? It's pretty simple, isn't it? It's... Who? What? Sorry. Okay. Uh, anyways, anyways. Um. It's the same reason that up and down... Are, have the associations they do with good and evil because things grow up and die down. It's pretty simple, right? Well, Destiny, yeah, both of you guys have been calling each other terrible names and like being real rude I never to each other. called him names. To be clear, it's only in retaliation to him. I came here to play nice tonight. I didn't know he was going to be such a degenerate. No, well, I know he's a degenerate, no, but not in didn't. these ways. <laughs> no, you didn't. Um, I just want both of you to know. I didn't call him any names. It's his behavior I don't like. It's well, the yeah, way yeah. that he passes sorry, his wife It's the last time I'm sharing a stage with this clown. Go ahead. Okay, that's fine. Um... I guess no more, no I more guess charitable donations to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> we can leave that to the uh, 5,000 view ministry stuff he does on YouTube now. All right, what okay. were you saying? Every one of us is a sinner, and you can True. be saved. Oh, the thank Lord you. gave his only son that each one of us can be saved. That's thank all you, I have sir. To say. And it's, uh, it's, it's precisely that, although I, I intensely and feverishly despise your life choices, um, it's, that's precisely the difference between us, because I will go home and pray for you, and you will go home and uh, bitch about me on the internet, and that's exactly the difference between us. You were us. literally complaining about me exactly in the bathroom the 30 us. minutes ago, Milo. We can see your telegram. It's public. You know that, right? What are you talking about? <laughs> I just separated the des from the tiny. Uh -huh. The des... That's all I did. Was I complaining from the bathroom? Milo, if um, Christianity is what's going to save us from these mass shootings, since... You know, you said that we've turned away from Christianity, and that's why the bad things in the news are happening. Mm. Why do we have so many Christian mass shooters? Who the Christian mass shooters? Who? Name one. The University of Texas shooting. It was a Catholic. Okay. 
so <laughs> we didn't think you'd actually have an example. <laughs> I have a list. <laughs> no, 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 neither, neither did I, because um, there the are two, two problems with this, okay? Um, we live in a Christian country and in a Christian tradition, so everybody kind of like casually calls themselves something, um, regardless of how committed they were. And I think I heard somebody say, where did he go to Mass? And the, I think what he was getting at was, was this somebody who goes and listens to the gospel in church every Sunday? Pretty sure it wasn't. Um, uh, you know, everybody kind of like loosely calls themselves Christians in Christian countries, um, at least until very recently. But there is, aren't, aren't there more obvious common denominators between all these shooters than uh, religion? Uh, for instance, antidepressant drugs. For instance, ready access to firearms. For instance, uh, maybe even you might say their race and their gender. There's, there's stuff that's like much more of them no. have in common way before you get to Christianity. No? Like seven things they have in common more than they have Christianity in common, don't you think? The demographics follow the demographics of the United States. So I don't think so, there's a common so, denominator. So what? I don't think there's a common denominator between race, gender, whatever. No, I say, the, the demographics have nothing to do with this, whether someone's on prescription drugs or not. What? Oh, how many mass shooters were on prescription drugs? Literally all of them. No. Aside from, yeah, yeah. I mean, no. I, I, you can't name one that wasn't on something. I mean, I don't have the list with me. I can certainly pull it up if you want. Every mass shooter has been on something. That is false. Dylan, also, I think Dylan it's Roof disgusting was on that it, you came here to our state talking about our children that died in a mass shooting as a political point. That is absolutely violent. I live know? here. I live here, and I go to church here. Excuse okay. me, ma'am. So pipe down, because I, as a resident of, as I have, ju I have just as much. Hey, I think you need to excuse pipe. Excuse me, I have just as pipe down. As somebody who lives here, I have just as much standing as you do to talk about the dangers in churches and schools, because I go to church every Sunday. Do you? Because if you don't, I'm at more risk than you are. No, you aren't. No, you aren't. What do you, you are not? Why am I? Why am I not at more risk than you are? Can I have an argument instead of petulance? No, Where I can't. You're petulance? leaving. Okay, very good. Where was the petulance? Oh, that was indicated by my sarcastic imitation. No, you aren't. That's petulance. I'm talking. <laughs> then please. Where do you go to church, Mom? I don't go to church. No, you don't. So um, if the uh, shoot shootings have happened like quite a lot in churches and synagogues lately, right? Whether it's a right winger, a left winger, they're black, they're white, whether they're targeting Christians, they're targeting Jews. It seems to happen quite a lot in uh, places of religious worship lately. Do you go to, do you go to synagogue or temple? No, but do you also, go to a mosque? Do you go to school? Do you because go to it happens at schools a lot. Yeah, I'm in one now, but uh, you evidently didn't go here. I do. I Wait, grew are we up in a school or are we in a convention center right now? Uh, I think they were. I thought we were at a university. The answer to your question is go to Wikipedia. Did they not let us on the university? Okay? Yeah, All the Christian mean, shooters that were mass shooters yeah, weren't real Christians. Like okay? Christians. Apparently that's the answer. Well, I think if you look at the manifestos, you can see what motivates them. And in many cases, it is racially motivated. There's no point denying it. But um, I don't recall anybody drawing on early church fathers to justify their massacre of children. Uh, not would you for say, would not you say that there anyway. is an, an ethnic bend to Christian nationalism? Uh, yes. Okay, so, then, and how, I think so then who is to say that a mass shooter that cites ethnicity for an, inspirating, uh, an inspiring factor for why there's a mass shooter, like, like why, why would you not say that Christian nationalism might play a role into that? I think it's a pity that there does seem to be a sort of racial inflection to Christian nationalism. It's not a dimension of it that I uh, share or, or care too much about. Um, in my previous life, obviously, I loved and married and settled down with somebody who is not of my own race, and if, if, um, you know, if, if, if the people that you choose to hang out with when you don't have to uh, don't establish your you know, racial attitudes, I don't know what would to anyone's satisfaction. Um, so I don't know, um, I, I don't love the, the fact that most of these Christian nationalists seem to be young white guys, but by the same token, I've seen black conservatives, and uh, uh, I think we'll, we'll stick with what we have for now. Um, Certainly, I do think it's a responsibility of older uh, and better educated Christians and these guys, confessor priests, to remind them uh, that there's no skin color. Uh, I'm just curious, for you heaven. personally, if you could choose between 10 million Mexican Catholics coming into this country mm. or 10 million atheist Norwegians. Well, I'm very racist against Spanish people, so it's, you put me in a bit of a bind. I like blacks, I like whites, I like Asians. I don't love Spaniards, so you put me in a bit of a bind. Um, but I would have to come down on the side of Christians no matter where they're from. Well, that's good, okay. Oh, okay, I was having fun. Um, uh, this is a question for uh, Mr. Atentacupo. Um, 
I was raised Catholic. I don't know what that is. You're going to have to explain your Bob. I'm sorry. No, though I don't really know how to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with Greek. Um, my question is, I was raised Roman Catholic. Uh, mm -hmm. I attended both Latin masses and uh, English language masses up until, mm -hmm. uh, up until my sophomore year of college, which was very recently. Uh, I, I have also been uh, a homosexual my entire life. I've been attracted to men. I have had exclusively sex with men. All of my relationships have been with men. And I'm very aware of the fact that these homosexual relationships are a sin according to Catholic doctrine. And I'm wondering if you have practical advice for overcoming these things. I'm not interested in whether you, or not you, they're I simple. mean, are you sincerely... Um, I am I'm sin completely sincere. I mean... Because uh, uh, I will have a real conversation with you. It's just that there's been a particular tone this evening, you know, so... Um, this is... I have been very ironic with you and sarcastic, but this is a completely sincere question. You can understand question. why I'm asking. I totally understand. I mean, um, I could... We could talk in the bathroom if you'd like, but... <laughs> Def definitely, definitely. I'm interested not. in um, actual practical applications. I'm not interested in whether or not. It's quite it's a short refractory ethical. index from mocking someone to saying you want to have sex with them. Um, all right, uh, look, what the church teaches is not that the. Look, homosexuality in large part is a cluster of uh, symptoms to, to early childhood trauma. Whether that trauma is uh, having no rail, male role model to look up to. Um, uh, whether it's the failure to uh, uh, form uh, uh, platonic attachments with you know, male authority figures, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that can happen, or sexual assault. Um, you're not responsible for what happens to you, but you are responsible for what you do afterwards and what you do with that. And but I'm looking for church. practical advice, day-to-day -day things. Sure, well then you should, the, 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 the easiest, the first Stop thing. Stop fucking men, isn't the that first like the? <laughs> Isn't that like the only thing you can say? I mean, what else can you do? Easier said than done. As, as my damp pillows will attest. Uh, um, I, I think that the first thing, look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna assume that you're being serious and I'm not gonna give you any sort of flippant, frivolous kind of day-to-day -day whatever. Um, uh, I practiced mortification when I was uh, getting myself out of that, I used hot oil because um, it's extremely annoying and lasts a really long time and it kind of like kills any sort of sexual appetite. Um, but the first step before any of that is to figure out why you ended up like this in the first place. Because you weren't born this way, that sort of 1980s propaganda. Um, there's no gay gene, they would have found it by now. We have mapped the genome, it's not there. Um, the, something was done to you or something was not provided for you. And one or both of those things happened which produced these feelings. And if you want to get right with God, the first step is to find out what it was because you might not know and you might not remember. Um, the best place to go for that is a, a therapist who was trained um, by any of the sort of descendants of the Joseph Nicolosi school. So Joe Nicolosi is kind of like the sort of godfather of, uh, they call it reparative therapy now. Um, and his son is still active and they still train therapists and um, within a quite a short space of time uh, they will help you to find an answer. And there are a variety of therapies that look to the observer extremely funny um, <laughs> that, that, that nonetheless do work and I'll let you discover what some of those are for yourself. Um, but uh, there, there's a path out if you want it. Almost everybody can reach celibacy if they are sincerely committed to it. Um, and the numbers vary from like 10 to 20 percent uh, people who um, successfully manage to enter into a, a relationship with a woman, have an active sexual life, and have children. Somewhere between one in 10 and one in five. Uh, I'm gay, sorry, gay is celibacy the best case scenario for a homosexual? For a lot of people, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bosch. Thank you. Again, I. Hey, Destiny, so you had a great talk with the Muslim extremist Quarantos about uh, how his great audio quality and uh, good takes about uh, how Muslim uh, nations are greater than uh, Christian nations. I want to ask Milo how you would implement Christianity when they are barely holding on to their legitimacy when Islam is gaining traction and while Christianity is taking D-list celebrities that take cock, well, at least if 20 years ago, or uh, 
20 minutes ago. OK, I'll, I'll ignore the last bit. Um, uh, Catholicism and Islam are both uh, growing. And I, the, the reason for that seems to be that um, people correctly intuit that if, if a belief system or a club, a society, a way of life kind of demands nothing of you, then it's probably not worth very much. Um, so people are very, uh, it's one of the reasons that Protestants are so kind of ideologically promiscuous, you know, that uh, church hopping happens when all you have to do is just show up, listen to a preacher for 45 minutes, you know, listen to some nice music and go home. Uh, people don't get very much out of it because there's not really much to get out of it. Islam and Catholicism are quite demanding and they ask a lot of their followers. Uh, and uh, In the world we live in today, it's no surprise that they're both growing. Uh, I... D you say implement like it's you know, the death penalty or something. Um, what I would suggest is that America rediscovers its founding principles, which are not untrammeled uh, freedom. Freedom of religion in America was designed to avoid Protestant wars. It wasn't so Muslims could take pu public office. And that should be reversed, and it should be against the law. If you live in America and you're a servant of the people in America, you should be a church-going Christian. It ought to be a rule. But something happened in 1776 that I don't think was necessary, and it was probably a mistake, um, when that ugly sedition occurred. Um, <laughs> instead of just throwing out the king, America threw out religion as well, uh, dissociating it from the state, guaranteeing freedom of religion, which is intended just between, Protest just between Protestant denominations, but of course would always blossom out. And then it sort of, guarantee, enshrine the right to uh, commit various infractions against the Ten Commandments, including the First Amendment. Um, I think if you want to sort of reinstitute things, all you really need to do is to return to an understanding that uh, none of this stuff works without Christianity. Um, and one of the ways to communicate that would probably be to reestablish uh, maybe Presbyterianism or Episcopalianism, probably the Episcopal Church, I would guess, since that's the one that most of the presidents seem to go for. It's the Church Tucker goes to, it's the National Cathedral in Washington. Most of the elites in the country are pretty, pretty happy with Episcopalianism. Um, you know, you get back home to the real religion eventually, but let's start with that. Um, it seems to me that that should be quite quickly reestablished so that all public bodies operate not only in the name of America, but in the name of God. Uh, and then if you want to be elected to any kind of public office, you have to be Christian. Well, how would they implement that? Or well, you don't like the word implement because it sounds like you're forcing them, but it mm -hmm. seems like average Americans don't even care about their Christianity and don't even relate their morals to how good their lives are. Well, people know if you're a Christian. I mean, they know if you show up to church. It's a sort of uh, only when you take God out do you need like social credit scores because no one's really like paying any attention to each other. So you have to kind of have this like weird uh, Orwellian technological horror show where technology tries to piece together information about a person to figure out if they're okay or not. Uh, everybody in your parish knows if you go to church or not. If you run for public office and you don't go to church, you're not eligible. Uh, and then the, the onus you know, <laughs> falls to you to prove that you, that, that you um, are what you purport to be. That doesn't seem to me to be a problem. Anyone who goes to a regular local parish will, will know that. If you're a Christian, people know. <laughs> you know people know when you go to church. And it's a, it's a, a, a gentler and more sophisticated and I think um, more normal form of kind of social currency and social capital than the, uh, um, you know, the horrific Chinese version. Well, that sounds almost as feasible as communism, so I appreciate you and good luck with uh, your future endeavors. Hi right, boys, I'm gonna try to ask two pointed questions to try to get some dubs for y'all. Um, so Milo, at some point you mentioned Dutch paintings. Uh, it immediately made me think of the Calvinists um, around the time period that you're kind of advocating to go back for. Mm -hmm. uh, and their biggest um, thing that they advocated for was they're very business oriented, but their simplicity and um, modesty were the values that they valued the most. Mm -hmm. um, how would you kind of reconcile in a transition to a society that has a Christian nationalist government, the American values of excess and stuff like that, you know, to the modesty Christian value that's really important? Yeah, uh, I don't think those were the American values until very recently. I mean, for the first 250 years of this country, precisely that kind of modesty obtained. Look at the 1950s. You know, you've got uh, there's a there's an ethos of, of humility, of service, of family orientation, 
right? America is kind of a Calvinist country. I mean, you go to Catholic churches, they don't feel like Catholic churches in Europe. They don't feel like, uh, it's certainly not like Italy, um, but it's nothing like France, it's nothing like the UK. Uh, you know, America, it, wherever you go, it is kind of Calvinist. There's a sort of over-earnestness, um, there's, uh, there's a sort of flavor of, um, uh, of slight humorlessness sometimes, you know, sort of taking everything very, very deeply seriously and being incredibly wounded by it and taking everything just like, you know, everything is the apocalypse. Um, and then there's a very Calvinist kind of um, flavor to things, and it's why? Because so many areas in America that now hold the reins of prestige culture are Dutch. You know, <laughs> that's why. Uh, because they come from precisely the place you're saying. So um, I don't think that uh, American values were ever really of excess. I think that's something that um, that's something that has emerged. It's something that's been thrust on Black America um, uh, as well. Um, these sort of very degenerate, self-destructive. Um, uh, uh, social attitudes that, that pop up in the music and the cultural rest of it. Um, I don't think there's anything particularly American about that. Uh, America's basically British. Um, and with that dash of Calvinism in from the Dutch up top, that's basically been the sort of central conflict of America. And the soul of America, even after the Civil War, kind of remained basically, vaguely, mostly Anglo Anglophone, Anglo, you know, mostly Anglo, although Americans don't like to think of it like that. Um, but that Calvinist attitude, which also, by the way, gives rise to puritanism and, pu and, and purity tests and cancel culture, is the thing that obtains in the Dutch areas, the Yankeedom, New York. Um, none of this has anything really to do with excess. Excess is a modern phenomenon that's driven by uh, runaway capitalism and uh, by a small group of people highly motivated to wreck the place. Thanks, Mel. I appreciate that. Uh, this one's for uh, Stephen over here. Um, so in your talk uh, today, you, you mentioned sort of like America's need of return to spirituality that can kind of lift people up from addiction to their phones, stuff like that, that can kind of, not a religious center to keep people at, on a moral level, but yeah, it almost sounds like you're arguing for like a re-faith in the American process. I know that you're big on canvassing. I drove some minions to your canvassing in Georgia. Um, what would be your answer to like first steps to try to regain people's political uh, faith and s stop the fracturing too much. Yeah, I think one of the huge things that we have right now is political fracturing. And I think the political fracturing has made it impossible for anybody to be proud of the country because e like, even things that we do that I think are amazing like become hardcore politicized. So uh, this is a risky one in Tennessee. I don't know how much the audience is mine, but like, I would consider, for instance, like the development of the mRNA vaccines. I think that that is like a championing of the American project. That was capitalism at its best with Trump doing the warp speed thing to use the government to incentivize like a company that was working with other companies all over the world to engineer and create a vaccine in like less than one year for a novel virus. That's something that I would hope that like every American would be like, that's really cool that we did that, that we were able to do it that fast, you know? I know Trump wants to take credit for it. Um, and I think he should get some credit for it because I think the warp speed was a good idea. You know, he guaranteed money for those companies to take the risk to make those vaccines. But because we're so hardcore politicized, we can't take credit for that. Um, it becomes a political issue where, you know, even the political party that existed under Trump now hates the vaccine, and then liberals have their thing with the vaccine. It feels like every single, um, the intervention that we did with Ukraine, I think, was, was really amazing. I think the fact that Ukraine was a country that looked like it had no opportunity whatsoever to stand up to Russia, and with NATO intelligence, with US leadership in NATO, um, I think we've done something amazing there, but we've helped them largely on their own. I mean, it's not US lives that are being lost, you know, not to take any credit from Ukraine. That's something that I think is really amazing that America's done. Um, even things like Bush's programs uh, to, to, to fight AIDS in Africa, or Bill Gates, you know, funding for malaria in Africa. All of these things, I think, are really amazing projects that America's done, that all of us, irrespective of our political differences, should be able to look at and go, oh, that's really cool. I'm American, America did that, and I feel really proud of it, but nobody does. Because instead, these are like all political pawns to use and all little arguments on Twitter and stuff for us. So um, to, to return to your question, um, I don't like anybody that says a return to anything because it feels a bit fantastical. I don't know of any society that's ever like said, okay, well, we're going to undo the last 50 years of progress and go back to this thing. I don't think it really works that way, especially with how much technology has changed everything. So we need to be forward-looking, not looking into the past. Um, and, and I think that that forward-looking thing, it has to be with less division because the more divided we are, the, the more impossible it is for us to kind of all collectively like work and vie towards one particular thing, which in my hope would be like the American project, you know, however differently we all view it. 
I just have a quick follow-up question to that. So yeah, go a for lot it. of the wins that you mentioned were not specifically American government wins. Like a lot of those are private companies, like the, like the MNRA vaccines, like yeah, it's a great marvel of science, but a lot of that were, you know, they got funded, but it was private companies that did that. It wasn't the American government that made it. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but those companies existed in America for a reason. And a lot of the public research that had already been done on, like, the mRNA process, that stuff spans back to, I think, like, the 80s, um, where people were starting to, to do that. So we do a lot of public funding for general research. And then we had private American companies. But it, you're right. It wasn't just the American government. But, I mean, I'm an American. I, I, fuck. As Americans, we hate the government, right? I know in Tennessee you guys hate the government, right? Yeah, I'm not saying that, like, the American government has to do it. I'm saying America as a country has to do it. And sometimes that can be our, you know, our, our biggest companies. But you know, like I said before, like we, it feels like now everybody fucking hates our biggest company. Nobody likes Facebook. Nobody likes Exxon Mobil. Nobody likes fucking uh, any huge American company. We're like, we all like shit on our companies, and those are like some of the largest things we built as Americans. And it's like, well, fuck, like, yeah, I don't know. It just feels like we're in an area where, I, like, I'd be super curious. I did this with Adam Sosnick when I was on his podcast last. Like, when you ask people, like, what do you have, pr what are you proud to be an American for? That's a really difficult question to ask a lot of people. I think when I ask my parents, like, I'll get things like, um, you know, like winning the Cold War. Or, or stuff from like decades and decades ago. And I was like, okay, well in the past like, I, I should be able to say in the past five years, really. But like at least in the past like 10 or 20 years, you know, like what, well, are you proud to be an American? You know, people on the left will complain about colonialism and, and white supremacy and people on the right, um, well now all they complain about is trans people. But like, it just feels like we have nothing that we can kind of all say like, okay, yeah, you know, it sucks that we fought, but like in 69 we went to the moon. Like we don't have our, our, our moon launching now. Oh, I guess aside from the vaccines, I'll just, I'll give one more example so I'm not too partisan. Elon Musk. I hate that guy, okay? I really do. But Tesla's really fucking cool, and so are the rockets. SpaceX is really cool. F having the rocket come back to the planet is a really fucking cool thing. When we first saw that, I don't know how many people watched that first stream. That was like the coolest fucking thing ever. And this was after we were shipping our astronauts over, I think, to China or Russia to fly on their fucking shuttles to get up, up to the International Space Station. Um, but that's something like you can't be proud of because now if I say like, I, you know, I don't like Elon Musk, but like SpaceX and Tesla are pretty fucking cool. That's like a political talking point now. It's like, wait, you support the white supremacist guy that wants to, you know, bring people like Milo and me <laughs> back to Twitter? Like, um, yeah, I don't know. Just the, the political division makes it impossible for us to have like the shared idea of, of what it means to be American and, and what we should be proud of. And I think we need to work on getting that back. I think people like stuff that's good and they don't like stuff that's bad. People don't uniformly hate the government even here. I mean, people know that there are militarized police forces that are a bit sinister. They also know that the local sheriff, if you get pulled over by the sheriff, you're probably okay because they're mostly reasonable people. Um, they're able to distinguish between the government doing its job really well, uh, which doesn't happen very often anymore, and the government doing its job really badly, which happens almost everywhere. And the success of private enterprise in this country is because the government failed. It's not a sign of success, it's a sign of failure. The, the success of SpaceX uh, tells us only that NASA is more interested in, telling, in giving Muslims self-esteem about uh, scientific achievements in the Muslim world, where they still think that nuclear reactors are powered by genies and fairies. Um, that's what NASA spent its time doing under, under uh, Obama. No shit you can't get to the moon anymore. Um, so, the, the, you know, taking the shackles off private corporations so they can rape and ruin us all is, of course, going to produce some interesting and impressive economic phenomena. But more often than that, it's going to produce horrors. The vaccine is a horror. Um, this sort of thing, I mean, it's... I don't know how to respond to somebody who thinks that the vaccine is a good idea. My communist friends no longer think that it was a good idea. I mean, you could try it with evidence. I know that it's painful for you, but... The evidence of what? The, the fact that the most vaccinated countries in the world, the ones where everyone's dropping dead, the fact that it was never a problem in the first place, the fact that we should only ever have asked the old people to maybe stay in for a few months. Um, the, you know, the, 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 I mean, you talk about Orwellian tyrannical horror. You have nothing to fear from Christians, but you have a lot to fear from people who want to lock you, screw you into your houses, and force medicine into you until you can, uh, you know, and, and then tell you you can't go back to work otherwise. That's not private enterprise. That's a drug cartel. And that's what America has, because America hasn't really had properly functioning capitalism for quite some time. It's got nepotism. It's got all kinds of deeply, deeply corrupt, late-stage um, uh, sort of intertwining of government and business. And all of that is a sign of the failure of government, not the success of America. Hey, Milo. Uh, if Christian nationalism were to succeed, God willing, what measures would need to be taken to make sure it wasn't subverted? You mentioned that in order to run for public office, you need to be Christian, but like, mm -hmm. what policies specifically would need to be taken in order to uh, make sure Christian nationalism wasn't subverted in America? I mean, you can't know another man's heart, so you can never know if somebody is um, uh, 
all that they claim publicly to be. But when we elect politicians, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, that's really a matter for their consciences and for God. Because if somebody looks like a Christian, acts like a Christian, goes to church and says Christian things on TV, passes Christian laws, uh, invites Christians to the White House when they get elected. I mean, Trump, I'm, I'm under no illusions about Trump being some kind of religious leader. Give me a break. Um, uh, it, it, this is not somebody who can lead a kind of authentic religious revival in politics. Uh, no. But uh, he was very good to Christians, first president to show up for the March for Life, uh, first president to invite the, the number of evangelical preachers that he just was, and so on and so forth. Um, I think that's good enough. That's fine. Um, so as long as somebody is you know, doing all the stuff they're supposed to be doing, what they do in their private life, um, if they're elected officials, as long as they are not letting those values spread into the way they govern, um, we can afford at least at first to be relatively lenient about. Later, who knows? Um, but, but, but no, I mean, you know, if somebody, like I say, if somebody acts and governs and passes laws like a Christian, I think people will know if they're Christian. Right. No, I'm just. I was asking about like what those actual policies would be after those Christians were elected, like to make oh. sure that it wasn't subverted in the future. Well, uh, oh, I see. Um, well, so it, it works relatively well in Europe when you have an established church, right? So the head of state is also the head of, you know, whatever heretical sect of Christianity, <laughs> that, you know, you're, you're under. But um, no, I mean, so, you know, it, America kind of spiraled out of control in about 300 years, but most of these European countries were stable for, you know, 1,000, 2,000. It worked pretty well. Um, when you have an established church, so that government does things in the name of the monarch and in the name of God, right? So um, I, I know that this is a sort of a, a slightly alien concept um, in this country by design, but uh, things kind of work better when people are reminded, as um, my friend acknowledged, that there's something greater than themselves. And those public rituals, whether it's you know royal weddings or the fact that um, everything important that happens in the in the in a, in a nation's life happens in a church, um, it sort of has an, a, 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 a it has a an effect on the country, it, it, it has a really powerful effect on change for change's sake. People are much uh, less likely to do stuff like that. And if you look at you know, sort of where the great dramas happen of particular countries, um, America, it's the courtroom, right? We come to know ourselves in America through court cases. We don't talk about abortion, we talk about Roe v. Wade. The way that we know there's a problem with black America is the OJ trial, right? That's when white America realizes, oh, we have a problem here. Um, America's kind of forum for national dramas is legalistic, it's in the courtroom. Um, and that's because it's, it's wrenched down from heaven and it's wrenched down from the monarchy, it's wrenched down from anything ineffable, anything untouchable, anything aspirational. Uh, it's much more easily corrupted. So I think re-establishing the church as uh, making America's uh, official national religion and language and culture to be Western European Christian, um, it seems to have worked quite well for Europe. And I don't know if you can really ask of any civilization that lasts more than 2,000 years. Real quick question. Uh, would you outlaw usury in the United States? Personally, if I stumbled into... Uh, Pennsylvania Avenue as president, um, it would probably be my first executive order. Thank you. Hello, Milo. Uh, when you were the champion of uh, campus free speech in 2015-2016, you know, I, was, I was a big fan, uh, and I appreciate your work. Um, and as a fellow uh, convert to the Catholic Church, I was really encouraged to uh, uh, hear about your, your interest in the faith. Uh, but I have um, I have some genuine and serious concerns about some of your comments that you you've uh, stated today. Um, there is a strong a, a, a tradition in the church of of, of, of teaching dating back centuries um, that culminated in uh, the Second Vatican Council in the the document Humani Dignitatis yes. that uh, squarely condemned some of the things that you uh, attribute to this vision of Christian nationalism as, as heresy. Could you, and I'll, I'll, par I'll closely paraphrase because I don't have photographic memory, you know, mm -hmm. so um, uh, this infallible ecumenical council stated that uh, in its document proclaiming uh, absolute, re uh, proclaiming religious freedom that the truth can only uh, 
proceed or, or succeed um, by the merits of its own truth and not by coercion. So could you comment on uh, th yeah, these no, teachings? Absolutely. And, and look. Abs absolutely. And, and you know, nobody's, nobody's suggesting that, um, you know, we're going to be instituting a Gestapo or, uh, you know, or anything like that because that's an Enlightenment atheistic kind of thing. What... It's, actually, it's entirely, as you will know, necessary for our salvation that we have the freedom to choose the wrong thing as much as we have the freedom to choose the right thing. But that doesn't mean that in Christian countries there aren't incentives in the tax system, laws against certain things. Um, you know, I, though we ha must for our salvation have the freedom to choose the right over the wrong, that doesn't mean that in a Christian country that murder should be legal. It doesn't mean that abortion should be legal. Um, we must have laws and rules in order to have a functioning society that exist as much to circumscribe the uh, proper behavior of those citizens as it does to, uh, say, ideally safeguard their souls. So, no, I completely agree with you that, you know, people must have as much freedom as is practicably possible, but the Catholic Church is a very prescriptive religion that requires a lot from people, and the rules that it lays down for followers aren't optional. And in those countries that have had Catholic, uh, explicitly Catholic governments and monarchs in the past, that attitude has pr tended to proliferate out into lawmaking. Um, so I agree with you on coercion to a point. I don't think we should be frog marching people to church or, no, you know, or we shoot them. No one's ever suggested that. But we should make more things illegal that aren't illegal right now. Um, Destiny kind of mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to get some more expansion on it. With the effects of globalization and our culture, particularly um, religiously, a part of America's identity is kind of being this melting pot of the world. How would we realistically impose a religion nationwide without cutting off the American people from the worst of the world? Present day, how it is, we're so interconnected, and how is it plausible to... Um, cut us off and mandate a religion when the rest of the world is working for toward a more diverse religious scene and wouldn't doing this essentially kind of create a border between the U.S. and the rest of the world? Well, uh, I'll just give you an example. Uh, I would have to look up the reference, but uh, um, I think about 10 years ago, the Chinese government uh, dispatched uh, a number of operatives to America to figure out, like, what is it that's made America so preeminently successful? How, why are we now in this unipolar world where there's America and everything else, right? Because it can't just be this American exceptionalism thing. Uh, obviously, they didn't believe that. They turned their nose up at that. They said, well, what is it? Well, let's get to the bottom of this. And the guy came back, uh, the, the lead researcher that the CCP um, dispatched, came back with a, an interesting answer. It was Christian heritage. The guy ended up converting to Christianity. Uh, he said, the thing that makes America successful is precisely that heritage against which it's constantly kind of bucking. Um, that it's always sort of fighting against. And it's that tension within the limits uh, as sort of proscribed by the founding documents that has made America so successful. It's freedom arising from order. It's creativity arising within clearly defined limits. W what's happened since then is that those limits have been taken away, both for private corporations so they can uh, do appalling things to people and uh, abuse and uh, uh, addict us to various, uh, you know, various things. Um, and obviously culturally as well. There are things on television that should not be on television. I mean, it should be a felony to glorify gang violence. It should be a felony to glorify prostitu prostitution. Fucking obviously. Um, it's obviously, obvious that that's the case. Um, those, and America used to have all this stuff. It used to have codes for comic books. It used to have codes for Hollywood up until 50s and the 60s. And that's when everything went wrong, when those codes went away. So uh, it's precisely that tension, that creative tension between the box and all the people scrambling around inside testing the limits of that box, which has made America so preeminently successful because they just, there's just this alchemy. Like America just got the balance right for a really long time. Uh, that balance is now off. And you know, you can caricature Christian nationalists as, you know, wanting to return to some sort of dark ages, you know, people with it's sort of Game of Thrones kind of world. What they're actually saying is not go back to 450 BC, but could we just go back to 1950 for a start? Wouldn't everybody be better off and happier if we went back to 1950 just to begin with and then see how we get on?
Uh, hi, Milo. Big fan. Um, I have loved hearing like aspects of both folks tonight, genuinely. Uh, I first got a glimpse of Stephen on uh, Timcast a couple weeks ago, the day I got tickets for this. So I was like, wow. Uh, and I actually enjoyed hearing what you had to say then there as well, too. Um, Christian here, and wanted to th I wanted to ask this, like, if you break it down to the like, bare bones, religion is order. Would you guys agree with that? Like, like it builds a semblance of the structure of order. It, 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 yeah, I mean, it, it provides a framework, builds a box, builds a wall, however you want to put it. Yeah, we can't think clearly or properly unless we can build walls, meaning unless we can distinguish mm -hmm. some things from other things. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, the, I would say the way that I view it is like religion easily gives us a framework for ethics. It gives us a metaphysical understanding of the world, like where do things come from, and then it gives us like an epistemic understanding of the world. How do I know what's true or what's not true? I think religion like very easily packages those three things up. It gives it to us if we don't have to think about it, and then we focus on things like how do I make my wife happy or how do I take care of my children without having to do all the work with the other stuff too. How are you getting on with keeping your wife yeah. happy? <laughs> Better than you are with your ex-husband. <laughs> I don't uh, know. He just got a Ferrari. It seems all right. <laughs> the the point I'm getting at is uh, if you look at you know, Council of Nicaea. 350 AD to now, same pages in the book, same laws, same directives that we've been given as Christians. Um, but if you look more, and to a point that I love that you brought up this uh, tonight was that you know Christianity, uh, organized religion has gone down in the last, what, 20 years, 30%? And you see this rise of leftism. And you see this rise of people talking, uh, or at least having a malleable framework that they just keep changing and how dangerous that can be because I mean Hillary Clinton uh, uh, totally against gay marriage come to a presidential election oh this is this is wrong that this uh, was ever ever prevented from ever happening she's pushing Doma the entire time uh, up until this point so don't you think it's a little dangerous for left-wing protagonists to have this ever-changing doctrine, whereas other religions have had thousands and thousands of years to just follow the same mindset, the same order. I think that, so while the texts themselves haven't changed, I feel like religious practices have kind of adapted to the modern era. Um, I'll speak very narrowly about my religious experience and more broadly. Um, very narrowly, I was a Catholic. Um, and I was, uh, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. In our archdiocese there, we had multiple Catholic churches, and just the divergence in thought around, for, for instance, gay people was wildly different from one church to another. Um, in one church, we had very traditional preachers, almost resembled um, my girlfriend's Baptist church, like very, very, very hardcore people, very traditional, um, no children, no noises. There was like a glass room. They didn't really even want you to bring your kids there. Um, and then in the other one, it was a way more friendly, more geared towards young people. I think we had, I don't know if every Christian church had like the 26 year old guy that was like leading like the band for doing the music and they had like drums and guitars and stuff um and and, and that was that was a uh, it was like a night and day difference in those churches that was just in my city i can't imagine like worldwide how different it is and then i look at people like muslims um and you you know we can talk about like islamic extremism um if we look at the um we'll trend I'll, I'll hit on the gay thing again um in the united states muslims as a whole are more favorable towards homosexuality than the average American population, which is wild, right, compared to other countries where um, there are some Islamic populations that still, you know, kill gay people, assuming you have enough witnesses or however it works in some of those countries today, um, or at the very least they try to make it illegal. Um, so all of this is to say that, like, while I think that sometimes Christians or Muslims or any of the Abraham or any religion, they'll kind of lean on their text and they'll say, well, this is unchanging, and, you know, um, you know we, we, we've got the same text throughout all the time. I feel like the, the job of the community leaders the preachers that do the sermons, that talk to the community, are constantly trying to, I don't want to say reinterpret, because that's not really right, but they're constantly trying to like adapt and readapt the, the teachings to make them fit in your modern day life. You know, Like what would Jesus say to a kid that's paying you know, more attention to his iPhone than his mom or dad telling him how to do chores? You know, you're not going to find uh, you know, Steve Jobs in the Bible, but you can still get teachings out of that. So um, yeah, it, it, it's difficult, but I, I think that religion still changes and adapts, you know, like anything else does, even if the text itself doesn't change. Is that, yeah, was that okay? Or? Well, yeah, I, I, the, the point I was making was, no, thank you. Uh, the point I was making was how the left 
keeps moving goalposts. Mm -hmm. They are, I mean, progressive, right? I mean, yeah. they're, they're moving goalposts. Tomorrow they may be completely against transgender, mm -hmm. uh, 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 anything revolving uh, transgender. They could be if, they, if it lost votes. Sure. Um, and you see that time and time and time again. Uh, whereas you know, conservatism, by definition, is kind of holding back towards days of yore, I guess. Maybe. I feel like both sides have changed a lot. So, like, for instance, if we, like, I don't, I think neocon is like a slur to conservatives, right? If you were to compare, like, the Bush era conservatives, those guys, to, like, the MAGA people today, these guys will hate each other, right? Because Bush era conservatives are, like, pro-corporation, pro-Iraq, pro-Afghanistan, roughly, um, generally speaking, and the Trump guys are like, you know, I hate big companies, no foreign wars whatsoever, you know, scroll all that stuff. Um, so I feel like conservatives have changed a bit, too. I do under, I, I mean, I agree that, like, obviously progressives are, are pushing the envelope quite a bit, and conservatives are kind of, you know, saying, like, well, hold on. But, like, their movement is growing and evolving as well, I would say. Well, the relative change is night and day, though. I mean, you can't compare the two. And I, I have to, um, I have never in my life gone into a Latin mass church where people are boxed off. Um, I think you just made that up. Uh, if you didn't, please tell us what church it is, because that's not Catholic teaching. Sure. Uh, one of the pairs I went to was St. Leo, the 10th, in tomorrow. Omaha, Nebraska. They have uh, like a whole little glass enclosure. You can go into the church, and you can see where the children are. I've been in plenty right. of Catholic churches that do exactly this for screaming children. Sounds like you haven't been in a church before, Milo. But no, go ahead. Um, uh, I've, I have been to... Well, you, see, you leveled the charge against traditionalist Catholics, and I've been to Latin masses with the FSSP and ICK and even SSPX all over the country for years. Uh, I must just have missed the churches you're going to, um, which is weird. Uh, as far as you know, Muslims being um, more pro-gay, well, there's two things to say about that. One, I guess that disproves the case that uh, immigrants are going to bring conservative values with them, so we should definitely close the borders. Uh, because if the Muslims are coming in pro-gay and the... Uh, uh, Hispanics are coming in uh, equally wobbly. There's no conservative social case for abortion. Close the borders. Done. Um, so that's 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 helpful to know. Um, but also, um, we're not. There's no contiguous landmass with any you know with any Muslim country here. Muslims who come to America are by definition wealthy, international, uh, globalized, and seeking Western values and seeking to live in America. It's hardly surprising that the people who leave the Muslim world to come to America might be more in favor of progressive values because that's precisely what they're leaving. Um, hello, um, it's nice to see both of you. Um, I'm also from Omaha, Nebraska, and I can tell you at least three other names of churches, St. Wenceslaus, St. Roberts, and St. Cecilia's, I'm and happy, one of I'm them is contritional. They I'm all happy. do the same thing I'm where they put the children in the back. Case, I'm not going to pretend it's a state I know well. So if that happens in that particular state, that's pretty gross. I also lived overseas in Germany. They also had that as well, into very traditional uh, cathedrals. My question has to, uh, is for you, Mr. Yiannopoulos. It has to do with why should we assume that a Christian nation returning to its um, Christian values, if we buy into the premise that um, this is a Christian nation, and it is a Christian nation because, as I understand it, because the founders were Christian, and therefore somehow that also influenced the text of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence, and that is what therefore makes this a Christian nation. My question to you is, um, is this return then, why should we assume that that would be friendly to all denominations? including Roman Catholics. And so my family is Roman Catholic, and I'm sure that you can appreciate this as someone who is deeply Catholic. Roman Catholics do not have a great history in this country. No, it's, it's, um, it's, the, a quite, it's quite an anti-Catholic culture in this country, the for 18, sure. uh, The know-nothing party of the 1850s, the mm -hmm. first Roman Catholic president was John F. Kennedy. Um, KKK went off to Catholics just like they did blacks. And this was all done in the name of Christian nationalism. And it no, was it was not done in the name of Christian nationalism because that, term, that term did not exist. Well, it was uh, attached to the same ide ideology at the time. Was it? Because you, you sort of did this sort of vague sketching of how somebody might come to a conclusion that since the founders were sort of Christian, then we should be sort of Christian too. But I gave you a much more precise and crisp and specific explanation than that, didn't I? What I said was um, that they were, these documents were constructed, outsourcing morality to Christianity, d uh, uh, disestablishing the church. And Adams said that they were constructed for immoral and religious people, and at that time he meant Christian. 
Uh, I also mentioned, and I, I did find the judge's name. It wasn't Rehnquist. I, was, um, um, I, was, I misspoke. Um, it was uh, William O. Douglas, who is one of the most famously left-wing Supreme Court justices of all time. Uh, and his quote were, was, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. The highest court of this land has confirmed repeatedly that America uh, has a Christian foundation. So I think it's a bit unfair of you to sort of suggest that I was like gesturing vaguely at the founders and saying, you know, well, since they're sort of Christian, then we've got a sort of Christian inheritance. I made a very specific and crisp explanation about the founding of this country. So let's just be clear on that before we proceed. Next up, I share your Can I ask a question on that? Why, we keep saying this, that it was so clearly a Christian nation. Why is it so curiously absent from all of our founding documents? Well, it was done on purpose, and it's not. Um, I mean, it's, it's not absent from Lincoln. Uh, it's not absent from, from our constitution, the thing that enshrines well, what the government is and does. And it, you know perfectly well it's absent from those on purpose because um, the state, th th there is a separation of uh, a technical, legal, and institutional separation of church and state in this country. But that does not mean that the founders were indifferent to whether or not people would be Christian. And indeed, they said the opposite. They said that they were making a country for a moral and religious people by which they meant Christian. So... Um, the, 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 the words of, that docu of those documents were written very carefully and mostly to avoid Protestant infighting because of the different uh, regions in America that were establishing themselves at the time. That's most of the reason. And they, those documents that do omit God omit God for a very particular and specific reason. But God is woven into the culture of the country, whether it is uh, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance or whatever else. Um, and and you, can see it, you can see that uh, tenor and texture and culture everywhere. In some specific documents, it is absent for the reasons that I've said. Um, but you know perfectly well, and uh, uh, as I've tried to explain briefly this evening, this, was, this country was created on the understanding that. And that's the bit that's crumbling now, right? It's the only understanding bit that's crumbling. And without that, the founders themselves said that the, the center cannot hold, and it isn't holding. And so um, that's the answer to you. And then I want to finish. Uh, I think the, the um, lady had a question for me, which I, I, I don't remember because I got interrupted. What oh, was the second half of it? I apologize. Um, it no, was, no, it wasn't uh, you. It was him. Uh, well, my question was, why should we assume that this new movement of Christian nationalism would be inclusive of all denominations. You mentioned, for instance, Pentecostal, Methodists, yeah. not a true Christian because they're not listening to the Gospels. Which right. Gospels, which interpretation of the Gospels, different churches have Absolutely. different Absolutely. We, we, we can't necessarily, and we shouldn't, and there's a long history of you know, uh, different strands of, of Christianity uh, battling it out. <laughs> um, but there's also, I think much more importantly, and um, more obviously, and more persuasively, a tradition of countries that have an established state religion and what that does to the culture and how it impedes change for change's sake. And it seems to be a sacrifice worth making. Um, but uh, yeah, sure, I share your anxiety about Catholicism. It's no, it's, uh, America has imported Catholics now and again when it suited the country for the labor force. Um, whether it's getting some Irish guys in, getting some Italians in. I mean, Catholics don't, uh, aren't ever entirely and completely at home on this soil. Um, uh, yeah, I share that. That's, that's fair. I think it's a fair question. I think you should push for harder answers. Um, when people talk about wanting to exclude certain denominations or exclude certain religions from the country, I think you should push them on a solid answer for who particularly do you want to include or who particularly do you want to exclude. Not to draw the parallels, although the parallels write themselves. Um, I think you can do similarly to people that are like white nationalists, right? When you've got people like Fuentes, who obviously has some Hispanic in him, right? Well, where do we draw the line at who's white enough for the country and who's not? And who's to say that once we've drawn one line, we're not going to look amongst ourselves and decide, well, we're going to draw this line even further. And I think it's a good question in regards to the Christian nationalist stuff too. I did a bit of reading for preparation for the debate and it's actually insane how like undecided it is what Christian nationalism even means. Does that extend to people's ethnic backgrounds? Is Christianity gonna become an ethnicity like, um, like Jewishness is just seen as an ethnicity? Um, you know, are, are people wanting to include all Christians but give some more rights than others? Do people wanna enshrine like Christian doctrine in law like Sharia law? Um, I have honestly no idea, and I don't feel like after listening to Milo ramble for an hour and a half, I have any more of an idea of what it is than when I came in here at the beginning of the night. No, I don't think anybody knows, but that's because nobody used this expression more than two years ago. Um, that's sort of what we're here to thrash out uh, and talk about. And no, you know, there's no there's no person, unlike some movements. I mean, America First is kind of you know, Trump basically owns that and gets to decide what that means. Um, nobody has sort of stepped up 
and uh, dis uh, uh, to, to, to the mantle of, you know, I'm the Christian nationalism guy. There isn't one. So, you know, I mean, Andrew Torber from Gab wrote a book, and, and Nick Fuentes talked about it briefly, um, uh, and, and various other people have used it. Uh, Marjorie's used it and all the rest of it. But there isn't kind of a Christian nationalism guy. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's concretely defined, but I'm not here to defend a nebulous political philosophy. Uh, I'm here to suggest that America might do better if in the commonly understood uh, uh, sort of bucket of Christianity, and people, you know, people make jokes and they say, oh, there's millions of Protestant denominations. When you actually look at it, you know, like 99% of people fall into one of these seven big buckets. Um, I think it's reasonable to say, well, if you're in one of those buckets, you're a Christian, that's, that's fine for now. Um, it would be better if this country returned to an understanding of that moral underpinning that was a little bit closer to the people who came up with it in the first place. Um, and that's, that's all I'm here to do. Um, I do have, I will push you on one more time, Mr. Yiannopoulos, mm -hmm. and I'll ask, I'll make it more specific. So specifically the question of abortion. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great example of how different denominations disagree very fiercely on that question. Do you know how that, how would, for instance, a return to a mm -hmm. move mm -hmm. to Christian nationalism resolve that? I don't think there's any plausible uh, Christian future for this country in which any sort of abortion is permitted um, under any circumstances. Uh, and that's, this is one of the countries in the world that's got a very creditable record uh, when it comes to uh, ferocious pro-life advocacy. And it will be reassuring to you as a Catholic uh, to, I think, probably to hear that um, I, I don't really see any way of this proceeding except under uh, uncompromising pro-life banner. Um, but these are, these, are, these are all open questions. You know, I'm, not, um, I'm not pretending to be an encyclopedia on Christian nationalism because there isn't one. Um, it's, it's something that somebody just invented. But I definitely will stand here and defend Christ as the essential moral underpinning of our civilization. And there are people who worship him in various ways. Uh, and there are people who uh, have fallen into various different kinds of uh, Christian denomination. But, you know, I think brothers in Christ is a reasonably well understood expression. Uh, and I think a fair one. And that's good enough for me for now. Well, uh, before I will say one more thing, and then I promise I'm going to hand the microphone back to you. Part of the reason why I'm asking is because my family history as a Catholic is as an Irish Catholic. My grandparents were involved with the Irish Republican Army at the time. Mm -hmm. The differences between Catholicism and Protestantism in Ireland during that time resulted in cars being blown up. It was a severe, it was not but a But you also know place. that there are a lot of other factors involved in there to do with borders, the English. I mean, there's a lot that went into that, right? It wasn't as simple as this is a religious conflict between North and South. It was, there, there, it, it was, it I was think it's most accurate to say that it was a, a kind of small civil war with uh, heavy religious overtones or uh, tempered, flavored, um, informed by religion, but this was not straight religious conflicts. It's just not true to say that. You know that. I do not know that. It was such a deep conflict that my grandfather couldn't take a civil service exam in like the early uh, 1900s. And I will leave you with that. I apologize for eating so much time. Uh, no, no, you you've been the most thoughtful much. question so far. You have no apology to make. Uh, my question's for Milo. Um, from Christian to Christian, I just want to let you know that there are a few things that I disagree with you tonight. Um, actually, probably the biggest question I have would, I'm a bit puzzled at Christian nationalism itself. It seems like an oxymoron to me. And uh, from theologian to theologian, I wanted to, because I assume that as a Christian, your beliefs stem from your theology. Um, I wanted to ask you a theological question. Um, I will do my best. I've never described myself as a theologian, but I'll do my best. <laughs> All right. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how would you respond to the themes of Jesus resisting any type of political or physical authority here on earth? For instance, um, in John 18, when uh, Pilate was questioning Jesus about his own nation handing him over uh, to be crucified, Jesus said that his, his kingdom was not of this world. Also, um, another example would just be Jesus healing the Roman soldier who decided to, to hit him, uh, right? Um, so how, uh, how do you know that you aren't wanting Jesus to become the political Messiah that the Jews expected them to free them from Rome, the very, the very same Jesus that refused to take on that role? Well, I'm a Catholic, so I'm quite comfortable with uh, earthly spiritual authority. 
and um, Jesus didn't live, live, leave us a Bible, he left us a church in the form of the apostles, whose descendants that we call now bishops um, have continued his teaching to the present day, and that institution has become very wealthy, very complicated, uh, very <laughs> uh, um, difficult to generalize about, and uh, very controversial, I suppose, if you, if from, from one particular point of view. Uh, Christ left us an, ins an institution. He birthed one when he said, on this rock I build my church. He left us an institution. Uh, the fact that he destroyed a lot of bad ones when he was here um, only really serves to underscore the point. So it's just a difference in authority. Can you, well, well there's well, a valid well, legitimate authority, which is authority stemmed from Christ, which is the descendants of the apostles, the Sea of St. Peter. Wait, can you, can you reread the last part of that question? Sorry. Sure. Um, I said, how do you know that you aren't wanting Jesus to become the same political messiah that the Jews expected to free them from Rome? It, well, okay, I'm taking a stab at it. It's been a long time, but I, isn't this what the render unto Caesar quote meant? That there are going to be things that exist in the domain of government where you have obligations and responsibility to the state, but those things exist separate to the obligations you have to your church and your family, so right. you can still live your best life being a Christian without expecting that to also fulfill like the political goals of your nation, no? Correct, which is why we, don't, like we're, why we don't necessarily need Trump to be uh, the most morally perfect person in order for him to be a good president. Exactly. Yeah, I think Jesus' main point was just that he wasn't aiming for political power, and neither should his followers. That was pretty much what I got out of that. Yes, that's fair, but that's, that's a different question. But that's fair. Thank you, everybody, for the great questions. Now we're going to do closings real quick, and then we're going to have to head out of here. Milo, you have five minutes, then Stephen, you have five minutes. I uh, seem to have got away with um, saying that I wasn't especially pro-Second Amendment in Tennessee, so I'm just going to take the win on that one. Um, and simply tell you uh, that I moved here with all of the usual assumptions about America. And having been here, I mean, it's, sort of, it's a difficult thing to hear, really, but you know, America is one of those countries that you sort of, what's that, what's that old quote? Uh, America always does the right thing once it's tried everything else first. Um, and America seems to kind of regularly need these uh, outside observers to tell it about itself, whether it's de Tocqueville or whatever. Um, it's not very good at self-reflection. So all I can do is offer you what I've seen, and that is that um, the gap between the way America describes itself and the reality here is so enormous and so gigantic and so suicidally large, actually. Um, the way that it, since the 1950s and 60s, this country has diverged from its founding objectives, from its founding morality, is terrifying. And the rest of the world needs you guys to be in good shape, to be in good fighting shape and to get it together. Because we don't have many other options. China, Russia, oblivion, right? I do still think that the world's in good shape when America's in good shape. But it hasn't been for nearly 100 years now. You haven't won a war in 75 years. Do you know that? 75 years America hasn't won a war. Things are going very, very badly wrong here, and we need you. But we need you to be strong, we need you to be healthy, we need you to be wholesome, and we need you to be moral. We need that from you. Even though you're, you know, our child in some ways, you've grown big, and you've grown strong, and you're our protector. But our protector now is writhing on the ground, diseased, shrieking, blinded, uh, and pathetic. And we've gone outside in the rest of the world from admiring this country, from moving here because we love the idea of its value so much, to being confronted with the ugly reality that America's greatest export is now sodomy and vaccines and stuff like that. And that's, that's not what it was supposed to be. So I would kind of encourage you to reflect on whether anybody is happier or better off, wealthier, doing better in 2023 than they were in 1953. And to say that you know clocks can't be turned back is it's just historically ignorant. It's just completely wrong. But what normally happens is they're turned back very violently. What normally happens is that they're turned back by force. 
and they're turned back too far or they're turned into something ugly. And that has happened again and again and again. And the window for America to save itself is closing. It's very narrow. Maybe a generation. Maybe it's too late. But you owe it to yourselves and to the rest of us to try. And if you want to make America the best it can be, if you want to be a good athlete, you've got to train. If you want to be a good writer, you have to read and write. If you want to be a good America, you've got to go to church. Thank you. I hate you, Sean. Um, this conversation was uh, definitely something different uh, than what I was expecting. Actually, you know what? No, it actually was, it was exactly what I was expecting. Um, I feel like Milo is kind of the perfect showman for the Christian nationalist movement. A lot of bravado, a lot of theatrics, a lot of uh, one HP voicing, but no actual actionable material anywhere, no concrete ideology to stand on, no policy positions to recommend, uh, not even like a clear or, or even a vague outline of what it is he even stands for. Um, maybe I just wasn't paying attention because I was watching Subway Surfers on my phone for half this debate. Uh, I don't know if anybody else in here feels like they came away with a better understanding of what Christian nationalism is than before they came in. But um, yeah, I, something that I get very frustrated about when I talk about politics, the reason why I do these conversations, the reason why I talk to people who are as far away from me as people like Milo can be, is because I think it's important to cut through a lot of the bullshit that a lot of people preach when they're trying to turn people over to their new political movements. I think that we have very real problems today, and I don't think we ever have a chance to discuss them when we're talking about how much better life would have been in the 1200s or in the 1950s. We're not getting rid of cell phones. We're not putting women back in the kitchen. We're not getting rid of birth control. The internet's not going anywhere. We're not locking down our borders. You know, we live in a world today that is as much different from 1980 as 1980 was from the 1200s that, you know, Milo's so obsessed with. And I think that we need better conversations with people, better policies that we can advocate for, better things that we can talk about to move our people forward, rather than having people endlessly fracture and atomize themselves in these silly little political movements that people can't even adequately define. So if you come away from here tonight, I hope that when you talk to your friends about things related to this, if you want to talk about church, talk about a church you want to go to, talk about actions that you do. The cool things about my church is that every Saturday or every Sunday or whenever you went to Mass, you got to meet a group of people, you got to socialize, you got to have a community. Sometimes you would do community events, and you would just have, like, basically communities that you would develop around that you would do things with every week because socializing with each other is really important. I think this is one of the things that we miss the most today, especially when we spend all of our time in front of our phones and our computers. Um, I hope that people continue to find things in their life to build upon. Uh, maybe in future conversations we can, or not we, but me and somebody else can talk about uh, the different things you can do to build upon that. Um, and I hope you guys don't get lost down these really weird niche micro ideologies that offer you, you know, the universe and talk about absolutely nothing. Thank you guys. Let's all give one big final round of applause for our debaters. I just want to thank several people that made this event possible before we leave and do the meet and greet and then I'll head out. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the exec board here at our University of Tennessee chapter, James. Everybody's been amazing, and I'm so proud of everybody, all the work they put in. They made this event happen for all the flyers they had to put up and get torn down every day by all the people that don't even want to see this debate happen. So it was fantastic. Uh, all the work you guys put in, all the volunteers who've helped out, and everybody who's bought tickets for this. I know there's some free ones here, but everybody who's bought tickets, you've helped us make this happen and afford it. So your money is going to good use. And Everybody uh, more behind the scenes have helped. The Knoxville Convention Center have been amazing. Both times we've been here, they've been absolutely amazing. I love working with them. We're just going to do everything here now. You know, we're always trying to find new venues, but this is just the best. And Superset Media for designing our motion graphics and our amazing cameraman in the back. I won't dox you. Um, has been amazing and has helped us with every event, making these live streams possible. So. Lastly, I want to thank all the friends who have been helping us and supporting us too. We had people coming out from, I heard some people were driving 12 hours, some people flew out, some close friends of mine I picked up at the airport yesterday to help out with this. So there are a lot of people all over the country that have helped out and make this possible and are making future chapters and events happen as well. So I am tremendously grateful and thankful for everybody's work they put into this. And if you want to follow these guys and see what they, where they're going next and what they're doing, Milo is pretty much only on Telegram. So you can go to t.me forward slash Milo Clinic, and you can keep up with everything he is saying there. And for Destiny, go destiny.gg, and you can find 
his stream and all of his social media is there as well. And if you want to start a chapter with us or come to our next events, we have one coming up in South Carolina next week and then hopefully, fingers crossed, Penn State real soon. We're going to have some really special plan for that after we try to bring Gavin McGinnis and Alex Stein and somebody spin Alex Stein and try to get the event canceled and they ended up doing it, unfortunately. So we might have some very special plan for that. Um, but if you want to do that, go to uncensoredamerica.us. And if you would like to vote in the final uh, poll as to who you thought won the debate, we're going to have somebody at the door with cards hand, and you can vote as to who you thought won the debate so we can see how you felt before this and how you felt after. And we'll post results on Twitter. So thank everybody so much for coming out. And if you're a backstage ticket holder, please start lining up here for the meet and greet. We'll have uh, do that real quickly, and then we'll have to get out of here. Thank you guys so much.